Hello everyone, let's see, is this working? Is this working now? We can always hope. Considering the fun that Xplit has been giving me today, we will say it's hope. Definitely hope. Uh, it's always a bit of hope. Right then, so... Starters. Yep, that's gonna be fun. Oh, I don't know. Let's check the audio mixer and check the settings of that, because apparently... This has been cutting off a little bit too soon, and all sorts of things. So hopefully that should all be better. Hopefully, he says. That should be better. It's working, but there is a build trance thumbnail. Ah, well, you know, at least one of the thumbnails was working. That's what we'll go with. Oh. Um, there is a reason why today's PowerPoint has a blank slide at the front of it, because for some reason, I have no idea why, but the joyous people at... PowerPoint don't like Japanese cruisers. Whenever I type in a PowerPoint which has Japanese cruisers as the first line of the front PowerPoint or the the title of the PowerPoint, it won't save as JPEGs. It won't it won't export as JPEGs. I have no idea why. I thought this was just one which was disrupted like this and therefore it would, you know, all the rest would be fine. But no, every single time I do something to do with Japanese cruisers, PowerPoint goes wrong. I have no idea why this is the case. Um, suggestions, please send in to me because I would like to know. But anyway, hello, everyone. Um, I have now defeated PowerPoint and I have suc successfully managed to secure this which is saved now as its own slideshow um yes i do now have a slideshow named one because that's the only way to get around that <laughs> oh how to make a naval historian a lecturer at the university lecturer panic have powerpoint go wrong uh or at least have a more a small heart attack hello john shea you got here very very early hello peter dawson Hello, Karl Gasberg. Hello, Abazaski. Hello, Bijan. Hello, Greg Sowski. Hello, Dead Squad. Hello, Sean V. Hello, Shumi. <laughs> I'm glad your mechanical room is dry. That's a dozen. Um, hello, Brainlet Mong. Hello, Abazaski. Hello, Kenrick Johnson. Hello, ooh, DG40. Hello. And David Hunt. Hello. Good morning. Seneca Nero. Hello. Is this working? There is a build trial font now. Yes. Well, it doesn't like, it, it didn't like, uh, this is the other problem. XSplit didn't like the thumbnail I was using originally. So I just flicked up one which would work because it wasn't allowing me to start with that thumbnail. There is not enough iron brewer in the world for today. But now, Good evening, Calvin goes back, and Zachary Gherkin, hello, and Michael Rose, hello, and Karen Johnson, hello. And, well, Joseph Eskins, hello, time to call Michael off, and Animal16365, hello, Wesley Phillips, hello to Florida, and Ian Carr, hello. So, today is Adrian Johnson's suggestions. Now, patron suggestions for October are going to go live tomorrow. The reason they haven't gone live earlier this week is honestly, I've been overswept with starting back university lecturing and the joy of family medical appointments and running everyone around and sorting all those things. And honestly, I haven't been able to do it properly, so it hasn't been done. But it's going to go up tomorrow because I've got all day tomorrow assigned to sorting out, very recording various things for the channel, but also recording bilge pumps, recording all those sorts of things, getting those set up. So it's going to be done tomorrow, and therefore the vote will be going live after that's been up for about a week or so. 
Yes, Felix B. Uh, yes, Joseph Americans and Stephen Lane. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, technology is hating me today. Have you Simon Thompson? <sighs> but to be honest, I am just about to talk about Japanese heavy cruisers and whether they were worth it. And that's an interesting one. And I was going to do a slide today, but that slide also got killed by PowerPoint of the various books I've used. And I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do each one of these books is going to be in a book or two to review over the next coming weeks. But obvious ones I had to make use of. John Jordan's books, Warships After Washington and Warships After London. Can never go wrong with these books. They're very good starting points. Uh, this is one I've shown you many times before. Mark Stiles, The Imperial Japanese Navy in the Pacific War. Sorry about that. And this book. This is one I haven't shown you before because it's um, it's contentious. And to be honest, I wanted to have used it before I showed it to anyone. The reason it's concentrous is because it's pretty much the only book available on the topic. So there are lots of people, of course, who disagree with it. Lots of people who like it. But really, the point is, it's the only one available. So if you disagree with it, you know what the answer is. Go write another one yourself. Until then, it's what we've got to work with. And it is Shokan. And it's Hirohito's Samurai. It's all about the generals and the admirals who ran the Japanese war effort. And it's a com it's as near enough a complete autobiography as you can get. And it is really, really worthwhile getting. But here is the point I tend to make about it. It was published in 1992. And that's now nearly 30 years ago, and it's still the only book on the topic. It was published over 40 years, well, yeah, nearly 50 years, but uh, over 40 years after the war was over, World War II was over, and it was the first book we had on the topic then. And it's still the only book we have on the topic now. So. If you wish to understand this topic and wish to understand Japan, you don't have any choice. You can like, agree with him, you can disagree with him, but Richard Fuller is the only game in town. I highly recommend it myself. I don't agree with everything he says. I'm a historian. If you ever get a historian, read a book and say they agree with everything in there, they're not a historian, they're a cabbage. Now, I can't say that. They, they could, of course, be occasionally a book that ha that happens, that their rare panacea moment happens. Maybe they wrote the book. But um, the reality is there isn't any other option. So this is the best foundation point you've got. If you want to understand the decisions we're going to be talking about today, if you want to understand the decisions about why things were made, the who were making those decisions, this is the book you have to go read. Because there isn't any other option. And I know I keep repeating myself on that one, but you have no idea how fundamentally annoying I find it that this is the only option. But do you know what's worse? There isn't even one book on the Italian Chiefs of Staff and the Italian Admirals. Not in English. So... Yeah. Hello, Matthew Malaki. Hopefully, and uh, hello, and hopefully this will inspire me to crank open my copy of Japanese Cruisers of the Pacific War. That's a good book. Um, I have to say I used this one and these two mainly because of the technical details I was looking for, and because I had this for the strategic uh, strategic points, and I was already using that for the chief staff. But those are four very good books. That will answer a lot of questions. It does sound like a project. Seneca Nero, do you agree with everything in your own book? I would like to put more in my own book. If I would had my way, my book would probably be about 400,000 words long. So, yeah, I do agree with everything that's in there. Do I agree that everything I wanted to put in there is in there? No. A 
There you go. Right then. <laughs> Revenge. <laughs> Forgot to pay to the pray to the machine spirit. Potentially. Um oh, one thing I will say. I'm on the subject of brew ships, and you probably already do follow them, but I have to say I've been chatting recently because of brew ships and the submarine stuff with Aaron, who's an incredibly nice gentleman. And when I say Aaron, you're all going to be look going, What what are you talking about? Who is who is this Aaron? Aaron of Subbrief. And he's an incredibly nice guy. And if you don't follow Subbrief and don't already subscribe to that on YouTube, you are missing out. Subbrief is really, really cool. The odds are though, considering he has about a hundred thousand subscribers and I have about six um that you mostly of you do describe to him but if there's a chance there is if there is a small chance that any of you don't you're missing out he's very cool and he's very nice and someday we hope to get him on brew ships on uh, bill trumps i'd like to have him on brew ships as well but you know that's me turning brew ships into a joint a couple of people discussing books uh, together and to answering naval history questions is a little bit off uh, I, I'm 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 getting there. I, I, I'm aiming for it at some point. Jeff mm -mm. even though they look the same, how did the crews evolve? A guns, extra torpedo tubes, and armor. Um, Jeff, that is a question which the whole video is going to hopefully answer today, so I'm not going to jump straight into that, because that's going to really spite my cannons for later on. Uh, Gemma, because I'm driving and stopper at road repair, one topic later was, were IJN cruisers after the Washington Naval Treaty Evolution World Ornaments, or more revolutionary fought? We'll get into that. Right then, so, first things first. As many of you who are return viewers might know, but some of you, hopefully, who are new viewers don't know, I've currently got a bet going with my aunt. Now, it's for family bragging rights, and it's about getting the 13,000 subscribers by December the 31st. And basically, it was started off by the Blackburn Blackburn um, design, which is for sale on my Spreadshirt store. And there are lots of designs. Up here, I'm featuring the HMS Unicorn ones I've got, which are quite cool. Links are all down below. And the thing is, she said if I doubled my subscriber count by December the 31st, she and my uncle would wear Blackburn, Blackburn face masks and take a photo and I could put it up in brew ships on 2nd of January. So the question is, do I think I'm likely to achieve this one? I think my aunt's got this safe one safely in the bag. However, am I going to throw everything I can into it? Like some... Loyal Japanese naval officer in World War II? Yes, I will do. So please, if you like, like. If you really like, please share, subscribe. Get friends, uh, get friends to watch, see if they like and share and subscribe. All these things help. Thank you. Now, first things first, let's do some quick modifications. Before I get into this too far, I need to do something quickly. Now, I need to answer a question which I was posed the other day. Were the Ibukai class battle cruisers or armored cruisers? And I said, that's too long for me to ask and answer in the comment section. So I'm going to quickly answer it on the comments uh, on the cruiser day. They are technically built as armored cruisers. However, in the relationship between them and the cruisers which they might have fa faced in Von Space Squadron, I would not have wanted to be a member of Von Space Squadron. Okay? That is a very, very heavily armed ship. It's also quite fast. But. I would argue they're probably reclassified as battle cruisers. A, for Japanese honor stakes, 
and B, especially later, I would argue this is to try and increase their tonnage relative to well, uh, relative to the various treaties to try and get as much as they can. And C, the final one is, well, they definitely don't fit heavy cruisers, do they? Let's be honest. The Ibukai class are, well, they are nearly 15,000 tons normal, nearly not far off 16,000 tons in full load. They're 147.8 meters overall. They have a 23 meter beam. They have an 8 meter draft. They have four 12 inch guns, eight 8 inch guns. They're not a heavy cruiser. But here is the interesting thing I have a fundamental belief. That if arm if armored cruisers had continued as a category, or re our heavy cruisers had been allowed to be a real heavy cruiser, that's what they would have been classified as. You know, this to me is more the forebear of the Alaska class than a battle cruiser is. So that is my point on this one. <laughs> also. I'm going to add a link in down below because, well, it seems sensible to add a link in down below. To the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Because I'm going to, of course, have to discuss the Kantai Kesson at a certain point. And the decisive battle doctrine, because that's, of course, what drives Japanese procurement. And that means I'm probably going to have to skip over some points because I don't want to, because there are so many cruisers to talk about in the time we have here today. If I include another full discussion of the Kansai Kess, I could be here for hours, days. And, um, yeah. Doesn't really work out technically that way in terms of things but i am putting in as i said those links so there are links down to both the live and the long patrol down below And, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. All right, let's just quickly get the questions up because the questions have helpfully disappeared on my side, uh, on my screen. Mm, hello, don't bear a Were they designed before Dreadnought? Well, this is the interesting thing. They are technically built 1905 to 1911, so they are pre-Dreadnought and in service 1909 to 1921. They are cool, though. Uh, let, let's be honest, that is not a bad looking ship. Maybe they'll classify as a hybrid armored cruiser pre battle cruiser. Or heavy armored cruiser. I would say it's. They are an armored cruiser. They are where the armored cruisers were going. And this is the other thing. I, there is a debate in my mind as to whether it's. The evolution of the armored cruiser, which gives rise to the dreadnought, or the pre dreadnought battleships. And there is a reason I'm think I, I I say this because to me, when you're looking at a true dreadnought, you're talking about something with 
an all big gun armament, you're looking at something which is orientated around engaging at the maximum range possible, which is why you have an all big gun armament. Which, if you consider the doctrines for the various ships at the time, the battleships, especially the pre journals, were more about getting close and slamming your enemy, especially because of the various technologies they had available at the time in terms of firepower. The ships which were disposed to keep their opponents at range were the armored cruisers. They were the ones which were supposed to either destroy cruisers at range in fast moving engagements or keep away from battleships. Long range engagement was more of an armored cruiser doctrine. So, you know, there are issues here. There are definitely issues. We will get into all of this as we go. Now, Japanese strategy and the Kantai Kesson. Seems like a good point to start with us. And it certainly seems like a point which we have to consider. Now, <laughs> Daniel Thompson, a friend recommended this channel since I'm into heavy metal. This appears to be very heavy metal, especially those 12 inch 20.5 guns. They were definitely good. Yep, yeah. Ibukai is a battle cruiser in the original sense of concept. A big bad cruiser that hunts other cruisers. They are fast enough. I would agree, but the trouble is they're not an all big gun armament. They're all not all the same gun, so that's where they. Uh, Honestly, I would forgive them the fact they don't have turbines. On especially the transition period, I forgive the lack of turbines. I don't. I prefer turbines, but I can understand vertical triple expansion engines. However, the fact that they don't standardize on 12-inch guns, that's why they're not for me. They're not battle cruisers. They are more armored cruisers. Zuski, were they designed with a second gun carburetor or Japanese didn't have enough guns for an all big gun battery as with their battleships? They were designed with the 8 inch from the beginning. Listen, I love the bows of Japanese ships. Ibukai has a nice not a ram bow. Rebuild for World War II be interesting. USN kept its big, uh, big 8 armor cruisers. Why not the IGN's big 3 armor cruisers? For what? I would argue that the Dreadnought design was due to the evolution of effective long-range fire control. I do agree. I agree on that one. But I would say that the thing is, the long-range fire control, the race of fire control, is actually being pushed by developments in armoured cruisers rather than Dreadnoughts. Rather than the pre-Dreadnoughts. So it's the cruiser engagements which push the technology which enables the evolution and, well, rapid evolution of battleships and the dreadnoughts up here. Hello, Runcash. Azaki, it was Tsuna that lost the race of being the first dreadnought because Japanese couldn't get enough 12 inch guns. To be honest, they lost the race before then. <laughs> Don't take this the wrong way, but no one's going to win that race. Uh, Jackie Fisher stockpiled armor, everything. I mean, there has... You know, it, it, it's like those five-minute meals, those recipes, whenever you, you read a, 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 a cookbook, and there are some, which are like this, which are five-minute meals, and then you read the prep you're supposed to do before those five minutes. And it's about a 35-minute meal. Well, that's the case with HMS Dreadnought and her construction. In that, yeah, she's a very rapid build. The reason she's a rapid build is everything was there waiting. There were no delays. None at all. 
They were just there. Jones, which was the Japanese dreadnought that got a mix of 1250 and 1245? Um, there were a few Japanese dreadnoughts. Uh, but we are getting really off topic. But I will, I, I will answer that one because I did bring up by uh, bringing up the Ibukai. Um. It was the Kawashi class, which got each got um, 450 caliber 12 inch and 845 caliber 12 inch in the Kawashi class. Kawashi and Setsu. Uh, Kawashi. Um, K A W A C H I. Frederico uh, uh, Vega. Stole is a bad word for requisitioned or borrowed. Um, it was fun, let's say. Now, let's start off with this. And actually, same time to start off, weird that you would fight USA across the world's largest ocean, and think of Kantai Kessen would be an option versus War of Attrition. Well, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, because, of course, the Chief of Staff series and the others. So I've been thinking about the Kantai Kessen a lot. And suddenly occurred to me, because actually it occurred to me, finally clicked into place last night. I'm often asked why the fights in academia are so vicious. If you ever get into a feud between academics, no quarter is a gift and nothing. And whenever I'm asked that question, I relate what a far more senior, very experienced academic I trust once said. The reason fights in academia are like they are is because the prizes are so small. When you are fighting over virtually nothing, losing is nothing. To Japan, and America, and all these things. Japan thought they were fighting over control of the world, to an extent. And, to an extent, they almost imagined that Britain be happy with its third, America with its third, and Japan, it would have be allowed its third. And that's how they'd work the world out, and the world would be divided up into thirds between their mighty empires. And that was the Japanese view. But that was because the Japanese, A, didn't understand to an extent the extent of the British informal empire. And the way British didn't, Britain didn't want to control the world, they just wanted the world to be in debt to them. The, the same empire the Americans put together, arguably. And for both, the, uh, for, to an extent for these empires, the world was not enough. That was what they, uh, that's what they wanted. The British sort of accidentally found themselves in control of the world. The Americans didn't want, a part of them didn't want it, but part of them sort of quite liked the luster of being the world's first power, which gives you the world. And Japan didn't understand that. And this is why I would argue, actually, Japan never actually properly employed the Kantai Kessen. They never actually achieved a decisive battle, and never actually set out scales to properly implement a decisive battle. But also, it explains different approaches to war, because the Japanese idea was that you'd have a decisive battle, Japan would win, and then peace would be agreed between two powers. It was a very Greek's approach, in many ways, if we look at ancient history. Whereas the Americans and the Brits have this sort of Roman mindset, uh, in that we lost a battle. That's terrible. Build a new fleet! Launch another army! Ready to war! It's a case of, we lost, we're going to come back. Not, we lost, and we're going to have a negotiation. And 
Hmm. And it's fun. It's the, the the joy of history. It's the differences of history. Mm. But that is why the Japanese have the Kantai Kesson. Because also, and this is the point we're going to get into the cruises, they don't have the infrastructure for a long war. And you either have the option of building the infrastructure to enable you to fight a long war and stockpile supplies, like Fisher did with HMS Dreadnought, and or Or, and this is the real problem, or you have a, a situation where you have to come up with a strategy, and that's the Kantai Kesson, that fits the limitations of your strategic situation. But then, of course, you have to actually employ that strategy. And let's be honest, the Japanese have, exam have opportunities. Pearl Harbor. Coral Sea, you'd argue more than Midway. Um, Battle of the Philippine Sea, of course, they can be argued to be trying it. But they don't really. Because a core point for the Kantai Kesson, a core critical component of it, is that they are supposed to be committing their whole fleet. Everything. And the reality of war means they never get to do that. Also, the reality of their actual fighting of the war means they never get to do that. And if you consider Pearl Harbor, they have more carriers available. They could have sent more. You can then argue, well, they didn't have the fuel supplies, and they therefore they sent the maximum they could send. And you are perfectly right. But the Kantai Kesson calls for the hot maximum amount of force. The total force. So if you are accepting less than total force, if you are not the, putting the entire capabilities of your entire maritime industry behind achieving that decisive battle, then you are not doing the Kantai Kesson. And this is the reality. So the Japanese have a strategy they build war for, but they don't actually use, they build their fleet for, so that fits their industry, but they don't actually employ it. John Shea, are you sure that the UK and the US aren't just not overly stubborn? It's nicer to describe it as the Roman way than they're just stubborn. <laughs> but you're you're pretty true. You are pretty true. So where do the cruisers fit in the doctrine? Well, this is an interesting question to start off with. It's an interesting question to think about because Fitting into the doctrine is as important as anything else. You if you don't have a doctrine place for cruisers, then why would you be building cruisers? So they must have had a doctrine role for the cruisers. But actually, the Japanese cruisers are probably in some of the most trouble. Because where they fit is a constant issue for them. What are they going to be doing to use? Uh, David Hunt. So Japan is basically Carthage. To an extent. I would mm, suggest more Philip the uh, Philip the Sixth Macedo uh, Philip the Sixth of Macedonia, I think. Is it the sixth or the second? Okay. 
Yeah. Fill up the fifth. Yeah, fill up the fifth, I think, of the Macedonia. Macedon. That's more. He's more like Macedonia. They're more like Macedonia than they are Carthage. Uh, although you can also go with Carthage because they have a Greek style of war, and they do expect the Romans to negotiate peace and accept their portion of the world. And honestly, if you think about it. To an extent, the, the, the Carthaginians have a better right to uh, sort of do that philosophy than the uh, Japanese, because the differences between Carthage and Rome are not that great. Ibukai has turbines. Shafila. Um... No, Ibukai, I'm fairly sure the battle cruiser, Ibukai, the i.e. the large cruiser, um, has, oh, no, it's uh, Karuma, which has um, vertical triple expansion reciprocating engines. Ibukai does have, they get, eventually gets, According to notes, and notes was originally designed with triple expansion engines, but that gets eventually gets fitted with Curtis steam turbines on Miraba boilers after the steam turbines, which the Japanese have been designing for them uh, to uh, had been designing for it, were didn't work. So very tortured history, but. Hmm. David Hunt, what's the logic behind the mixed 12 inch battery? Uh, no logic, it was only just the 12 inches, the uh, 12 inch guns I could get. And. Hmm. Uh, Drone Cash, the Japanese army must have had some huge heavy cruisers being built on secret to humiliate the heavy. No, they didn't. Mm. One brew down, 30 to go. You do not want to know how much iron brew I drink. Seriously, it would scare the life out of all of you. Ryan, uh, Animile 16.65. The Encantai Kesson seems to be a combination of Junicol, Alfred Mahan, decisive battle, with submarines and aircraft carriers thrown in. To an extent, but I do sometimes argue that's a very uh, Western-orientated political viewpoint of Japanese maritime strategic thought. And the reason I say that is... You're all, uh, one of those things you're presuming is that the Japanese... Uh, those assumptions may, uh, mean is those are a French school, the Jeune Nicole. Mahan, an American. There's also Corbett. So, okay, let's get thrown in there somewhere in Richmond, who are two British. And whilst many Japanese officers do serve abroad and do wander around the world and do naval officers do speak multiple languages, Japan also has some very fine naval academies that stand up themselves. And they have a lot of history of warfare. And a lot of history of strategic thought. And they do have their own philosophy does feed into these things. So even if they are drawing to an extent from Western and European Western examples 
and they are those examples are being filtering into their own thoughts they do very much have their own thought process so yes they do maybe take snippets from those ones and arguably you can put the point for they do argue they do take snippets but they do have their own philosophy and this is seen in their cruises because here is the thing theoretically in the canton kesson the role of the cruisers reconnaissance and they're to carry the reconnaissance aircraft because the carriers have to focus on the strike because it's all for the decisive battle, which means it's all about the big punch, the big carrier strike, and then the big mauling battle fight with the you know where the remnants of the American fleet, which has been decimated and damaged by submarines and by long range torpedo strikes and air strikes, will come face to face and with their mighty battleships. And those mighty ships with all their firepower will, despite probably still being outnumbered by the Americans, will overwhelm them and win, assuring a great and glorious victory. There is a problem for this. The cruisers in this role are reconnaissance, screening, and supporting the battle line. Now, heavy cruisers don't tend to get used for screening much. There ain't enough of them. So uh, that one's out. But reconnaissance, yeah, they're going to carry your aircraft and supporting the battle line. Uh-oh. Now, supporting battle line is something which traditionally you could do with cruisers. However, those of you who have been paying attention to previous videos will know that the cruisers which used to support the armoured, uh, the battle line, were the armoured cruisers, which were in the 16,000 ton range. 14 to 16,000 ton range on the pre dreadnoughts. And then the battle cruisers came along, and arguably they evolved from the armored cruisers, and that's why they are arguably are large armored cruisers. But the trouble is, battle cruisers have now become part of the capital ships. Which means the cruisers you have, well, they're the heavy cruisers. And heavy cruisers have an 8-inch gun and are limited theoretically to 10,000 tons. Now, yes, the Japanese are going to take that with a very, very large berth. But there is only so much you can do without being so horrendously beyond the um, stats that you can't fail to be called out. And that limits the Japanese. Uh, Paul Wyatt, question for later. In a light cruiser gunfight, uh, taking a, a, a hit, well, a, a, a cruiser gunfight, taking a hit to loaded torpedo tubes could be catastrophic with burning fuels and warheads. Was it Japanese doctrine the Japanese torpedoes when the shooting started? Uh, usually it was their doctrine to fire their torpedoes when the shooting started. And remember, they have quite long-range torpedoes. The idea was to use them before they get started. However, the Kantai Kesson misses what the Juno Cole and Mahan both get, where the down, oh, wear down the enemy economy. Calvin Gasberg, there is one small problem with that, and this is the problem with their cruisers, and where their cruisers actually could have been used. If their cruisers had been designed as long-range surface raiders, then they could have attacked the Japanese, the enemy's economy. But the problem is, where does the trade go? Remember those maps I've shown in the past, and I should, I, I, I'm remiss, I don't have my map with me ready to pop up this evening of the trade routes, which the British were always using. A huge map of trade routes and all the trade which goes backwards and forwards around the world. The vast majority of the trade from Britain is India to the west, uh, India heading west, not east. The trade from America, the vast majority of their trade is either coastal or Atlantic, which means it's the other side of the Pacific from you. So you need very, very long-range ships. and Because you, you're probably not going to be able to build submarines that can, uh, that can manage that longer range viably enough. 
you can probably build some that can do the range, but if you build enough of them, can they be in enough places? Can you build packs? You're talking about having to build three to four hundred submarines on a scale like what Germany achieves during World War Two. But they're all got to be the very big I-400s that are going across there. And it gets very difficult very quickly if you're going to do a submarine warfare. If you're going to do use surface raiders, again, you build cruisers. But they don't do that because where are those surface raiders going to have to go? They're going to have to go to the South Atlantic. They're going to have to go into the deep into the Indian Ocean. And what are they likely to find? Well, the Japanese are slightly smarter in a way than the Germans here because they think, well, hang on, if we send that there, well, the British will A, have packs of cruisers because we worked with the cruisers in World War One and saw what the packs of cruisers were doing. And B, the British have this these ships called Renown, Repulse, and Hood. Taylor made hunting down surface radar ships. And our surface raiders are going to be operating a long way, and how quickly can we replace them? So, yes, economic warfare would be sensible, but where's the economy for them to attack? You can point out that the Kantai Kessen doesn't leave anything left for protecting their own economy. That's a good point. But the trouble is, if they, if with the limited resources they have to build their armed forces with and build their navy with, and you'll see that when we're talking about some of these ships, they're ordered in the 1930s and not started construction until 1940. They are trying their best with what they have available, but if you have to pick, they will pick it. it, it they are have to pick whether they can provide forces for convoy protection, maritime security, those sort of roles, or whether they provide a battle fleet. It's one of the other problems which you really is like made stark when you look at Japan that makes when you look at Britain in 1939, suddenly Britain looks a lot better prepared because Britain does have the money and the maritime industry and the ability to be able to do both at the same time. And that is what they are doing. It doesn't mean they necessarily have as much force that they want for both, either role, but they're able to do both. The Japanese don't have that level of resource. And this is really felt in their cruiser doctrine, and really felt in their cruisers. So let's get on to our first class. And they are the Furutaka. Uh, for attacker. And I'm just going to type in the thing. So, these cruisers are, to an extent, contemporaries of the RN's early interwar cruisers. Ooh. I'm not saying their names, just the H's, okay? We're just called them the H's. I've got to do a video about them at some point, but I don't have money yet. Uh, Furutaka is laid down on December the 22nd, launched on February the 20, uh, December 22, uh, 1922, launched February 1925, commissioned March 1926, sunk October 1942 at the Battle of Cape Esperance. Keiko, her sister, is laid down in November 1922, launched April 1924, uh, commissioned July 1926, sunk August 1942, Battle of Savo Island. And yes, I have had to do the very horrible minimizing of dates things because there's only so much space on a PowerPoint slide and frankly it looks terrible. So the top version is how they were built originally, when they had six single 7.9-inch guns. The below is how they looked at the end, where they had three twin 8-inch guns, and they could then carry aircraft 
aft where they had one stowed and one mounted on the single catapult. And, yeah. So, these are the first of the new cruisers. This is what they are. They're the first of the new cruisers. Hello, Josh Williams. Good In Japanese naval doctrine, what was the point of refitting the Russian prizes as opposed to scrapping them? Were they in the Chinese prize ever useful? Um, to an extent, they are both a um, status thing, but also it's a method of rapidly growing your navy without building things yourself. It's far quicker to put a ship in a fitting out dock and refit it than it is to um, have to build one from scratch. Avdaski, were the Japanese ever able to control most of the Pacific after winning Kantai Kesson? No, but that wasn't the point. It's kind of the idea, remember I said the recent video about the risk fleet, that the risk fleet doctrine's problem is it depends on the fact that once you, once the British have lost, then everyone else is going to tear them apart. The Kantai Kesson's problem is the idea that once they've won the battle, everyone's just going to start having a negotiation. Or accept the results as a fit and complete. When in fact, even if the Japanese won the Kantai Kesson, they are probably going to lose a horrendous number of ships. In which case, they'd be pretty much crippled, and the Americans would be crippled. And at which point, the British get to decide who wins, because the British fleet, whatever fleet the British send at that point into the Pacific, will be bigger than either the American or the Japanese, in fact, the American and Japanese combined, if the Kantai Kesson works. So that's the problem. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Vision, what you are saying, Doctor, is that Washington should have allowed for six inch light cruisers and 12 inch heavy cruisers. What I'm saying is that 16,000 tons is a decent armoured cruiser. Um, another question. Is should the USN have built 8-inch cruisers or just settle on unified 6-inch batteries? <sighs> we will discuss American 8-inch cruiser doctrine at another point. At this point, we are concentrating on the more the Japanese 6-inch doctrine. And let me please say this. The Japanese 8-inch doctrine... Uh, it's Japanese heavy cruiser today, isn't it? The Japanese 8-inch doctrine and heavy cruise doctrine is, to an extent, coherent in comparison to the doctrine the USN goes through in World War, in the interwar years for their 8-inch cruisers. And the point is this. The Americans always have a coherent doctrine for their 8-inch cruisers when they're building them, just they keep changing that doctrine. So the doctrine by 1930, uh, in the late 1930s, is very different than the doctrine they start out in the 1920s with, which is a, uh, the, the weird thing. The Japanese have a weird doctrine for their 8-inch cruisers, which doesn't really fit, and their designs don't fit their doctrine, and that's the reason why they don't have really good cruisers. But at least they keep a consistent doctrine the whole way through. Uh, John Evans, why did everyone just head, did everyone just head for the treaty line side so quickly with the lighting cruisers when existing lighting cru light cruisers were five to seven ton, ton range? Uh, because honestly, if you're trying to fight a ten ton light, cru a ten thousand ton light cruiser in a seven ton light, thousand ton light cruiser, you're gonna find that whilst he hasn't had to put any much more weight into terms of power and engines and all that stuff, he's had a lot more weight available for armor and firepower. And that's the reality. Matthew Meek, hello. Did the head of the Japanese Navy actually say after Pearl Harbor, we have awakened a sleeping giant, or is that all Hollywood? Hollywood. The, honestly, the, the head of the Japanese Navy was saying that long before. <laughs> they, they were saying that before, long before Pearl Harbor actually happened. There were heads of the Japanese Navy saying, don't do this. Whatever you do, do not know to do this. Um... Uh, there are, uh, as I've discussed in the Chiefs of Staff, the the number of uh, uh, Japanese admirals who actually wanted to go to war of America were very few. The number who thought their only option was to go to war with America because of the scenario was the number which was deciding factor. 
Hagriff, this is my stalking horse for the plan, and it'll be useful if we saw videos about plan cruisers, frigates, corvettes, and foreign policy. Um, there could be some stuff coming with gold crumbs. Tasha's super shell. There was no chance Japan could crash the US economy. It is largely internal. Trade intuition of the US coast isn't going to produce anything like the German captains. Mm, that is a problem. And as Calvin Gunsberg puts it, Copenhagen infrastructure. At Jeff Kibila, what caused the Japanese to beef up the torpedo on their heavy cruisers? Were the extra torpedoes ever useful? Mikama uh, found they could be a battle hazard at Midway. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. Japanese heavy cruisers, and it's a good example is this one. Is this class. Because they start off, they have six twin 24 centimeter torpedo tubes. And then they have two quads after their final refit. So they go from having 12 to 8. And the torpedoes are fitted for much the same reason as the British are fitting torpedoes to their cruisers. Because if you realise you're never going to have enough capital ships to be strong everywhere need you, you need to be, then you need to make sure you have ships which can sink capital ships. And the only thing that can sink a capital ship, which... Can be fitted to a cruiser or a destroyer. It's a torpedo. And this is one of the reasons why the Japanese are putting torpedoes in everything. Now, the thing is, in the Kantai Kessen doctrine, those torpedoes be very useful. They could do long range night attacks with those torpedoes. They do them a couple of times in World War II. Those things are dangerous. However, as you point out in Midway, they are problematic. And there is a reason that as the war goes on, the Royal Navy starts to get a bit iffy about them. In that it prefers the torpedo launches on its cruisers, which have protection, let's say, overhead. And various other things to protect them. Hmm. I'm trying to get, I love how the tone of Megami class cruisers look. Too bad they they had their problems. Most cruisers have issues at some point in their careers, and the Japanese, the thanks to infrastructure issues, often have problems. Jeff Villa, the fur the fur attackers are actually big light cruisers in my mind. The Hawkins class were the twin flagship of the 1920s, except Raleigh, the uh, the badly navigated. Fine for the times. I would argue the Hawkins classes are actually big light cruisers as well. I would argue that both the Hawkins and the Fur Attacker class are actually descendants of World War I light cruisers which are being built up. And they're being built up, but the trouble is the armoured cruisers, which used to be the, different, the, the thing in between a battleship and a large and a lot and them, ha have gone because they've been subsumed up into the battle cruiser doctrine, which has been put into the capital ship tonnage. So that's where you got the problem. Emin, hello. What about a 10,000 ton 8 inch limit and a category of 20,000 tons with 10 foot? 10 inch guns? Eamon, yeah. you can do all sorts of different categories in your mind. I think, honestly, I think a 10 inch gun would have been the limit for any, if for an armor cruiser, if you d designed one after World War, uh, put into the treaties after World War One. And you would probably be looking at about 20,000 tons. And then you'd have probably gone for your light cruiser 10,000 ton limit with 6 inch guns. And then gone, boom, done. And then they'd have probably just settled on cruisers with roughly a 40,000 ton um, limit. They're quite cute, the Furutake class. Furutake class. Hello, Andrew Cox. 
Why six single turrets? They're so much better with three tombs. Um, you see, the six singles are how they are originally laid out because that's what they're originally laid out as because they have single turrets. They don't have twin turrets. And I would honestly have preferred them to have gone with four twin turrets. Uh, two, four, two aft than what they did do. They did a bit of, um, you look quickly, you can notice that that is a very much a, um, that's a Nelson and Rodney style arrangement, and I'm not keen on that. Anyway, now let's look at the Adobe class. Now, these are the next ones, and this is what the Americans reckon they are. So, this is the O&I statistics on these uh, ships. Length, mm, roughly 598 uh, feet overall. Beam, 50 foot 9 inches. Draft, probably 19 foot maximum. Displacement, uh, they reckon 7,100 tons in standard and 7,500 tons in full load. So, how many people want to, f want to put in the, the comments, and please do, whether you think the Americans got it right about the Oba class or wrong? And while you're writing that up, I'm going to answer Jeff Beeler's question. So the Treaty Cruisers are really light cruisers of 8-inch guns? Pretty much. If you look at World War I era light cruisers and how they developed, the Treaty Cruisers, in terms of the heavy cruisers, are really large light cruisers. And then you have the light cruisers, which are really more large scout cruisers. Don't worry, Eamon. We all do. Santa Canera, dead wrong. James D, wrong. Hello, James D. Um, Malaga, wrong. Hello, Malaga. Absolutely wrong. Just asking. Tonnage sounds ridiculously low. Jeffy, look. look at that catapult. Okay, right then. So here are the actual figures. And displacement, 8,300 tons standard final displacement, roughly 9,000 tons. They are both longer, they are fatter, and their draft is actually slightly shallower. <laughs> oh. And again... These are first ships designed from the get-go with twin turrets. I'm going to move the camera slightly because otherwise I can't sit here and it's not comfortable. Otherwise, so I'm just going to do that. Sorry about that, everyone. That's better. <sighs> yep. <laughs> Hello, James. They, 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 they definitely didn't use rice paper for armor. These things have a Three inch belt and a 36 millimeter deck, so an inch and a quarter deck armor. Uh, that's fairly thick. They could carry initially one float plane with one catapult. By their final thing before World War II, they had two float planes and one catapult. Uh, they start off life with 7.9 inch guns, that's 200 millimeters. They end up life with eight inch guns in twin turrets. As outlined before, they have the 4.7 inch. It's not just the British which love the 4.7 inch. The Japanese do too. And I would argue that the 4.745 in single mounts is actually one of the better guns the Japanese produce. And if they carried on developing it, they might have had a better gun AA weapon system in World War II. But they didn't. So they didn't. Ah, well, life happens. Now, the Overver class, always fun. And they are good little ships. They certainly give many people are running around for their money and they are built in february 1924 late uh, well laid down february 1924 in, uh, in urba's case 
Uh, Kinuasa is laid down in January 1924, so technically laid down first. But Aoba is launched in September 1926 and is commissioned in September 1927. Uh, Kinuasa is actually delayed. She starts first, but is only launched in October 1926, so she starts a month earlier, is launched a month later, but manages to catch up with Aoba in fitting out and is commissioned in September 1927 as well. Aoba is destroyed in July 1945 bombing of Cure and King Asa is lost in November 1942 during the Battle of Guadalcanal. Now here is something you're going to hear a lot. They had 12 Kampon boilers. This is something the Japanese do far better than almost any other navy. The only other ones who achieve similarity level is probably, to an extent, the Royal Navy, but even they muck around a bit far more. The Japanese, these ships are designed with the same, in, pretty much the same engine room in every single ship. It has 12 Kampon boilers, it has gears, to, uh, four gear steam geared st turbines it provides x hundred thousand shots horsepower depending on the power of the boilers the boilers as they get more powerful as they get better the technology uh, the technology going into them the steam generation gets more efficient the pressure gets higher they can produce more horsepower from the same number of engines as the same number of boilers they have a top speed of well when they start life it's 36 knots by the time they've had their final refit for World War II, it's 33.43 knots, okay? And they could have a range of 7,000 nautical miles at 14 knots originally. But, again, slight modifications, slight tweaking of the engines, and it's 8,223 nautical miles at 14 knots in their final configuration. So, they lose some of their top speed. But they gain in terms of range. And they transfer from six 7.9 inch guns to six 8.8 8 inch guns. And they again go from six double to two quadruple torpedo launchers. And they're also carrying 50. 25 millimeter, that's type 96, AA guns. So that's a lot of Aka Haka. Mm hmm. Roland Cash, uh, John Evans, didn't the UN, uh, the DNC say that if Montgomery was uh, was a declared tonnage, it was made of cardboard? Um, I think the, the, the director, of, the British director of naval Con construction, was uh, very interesting when it came to certain Japanese um, cruisers. Uh, there is a certain gentleman who called Stanley Goodall who comes up with some very interesting phraseologies to describe Japanese ships. It is sometimes if you ever want good reading, um, some of the National Archives documents from the Sea Lords minutes and the minutes of the Lords of the Admiralty having their discussions. When they come up with to start discussing Japanese cruisers, the DNCs in the 1920s and 30s can get incredibly creative with their descriptions. Uh, Ninja Ninja, hello, 2611. How do they compare to Exeter? As I see some similarity, if it's okay to ask, it's fine to ask. And there is a similarity in that they have the six, uh, uh, the six eight inch guns. Honestly, if I had to pick which one to be in, I'd probably be in the Oba class. Um, I have a reason for this. She has got the same firepower. She's got slightly less good armor. 
but her speed's better. The advantage of Exeter is going to sound strange is that she has actually probably better AA armament uh, by the time she's sunk. But I would still say this is the one I prefer to be in if I had to pick. How did the Japanese classify the first four cruisers compared to their later and more heavily armed ships? Were they assigned the same roles in wartime? They were assigned the same roles in wartime. They were the same, they had the same duties. In fact, sometimes their earlier ships are more useful than their later ships for various, for proper cruiser jobs because their later ships are so heavily modified for other jobs. These ones are still cruisers. Um. Hieroglyph, to my last expert, it's not totally un to my less expert, but at least not totally uninformed eyes, IJN cruiser doctrine did not change during the war, nor differentiate much between cruiser classes. No, we're, we're getting into that. As as I said, cruiser doctrine for the uh, for the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy, the cruisers are reconnaissance, they are screening, and they are supporting the battle line. The trouble is, uh, you can't really do the latter with eight inch cruiser. And I would argue screening with an 8-inch cruiser is not really that good either. And reconnaissance, well, it gets interesting, I'd say. Hey man, why did it take other navies so long to standardize their power points? Um, mainly, mainly because they were keep developing them. The Japanese basically do evolutionary development slowly in terms of each class whereas the british and americans are trying to push forward as fast as they, as much as they can and you also have to remember there's a difference in doctrine in that the british take a basically a 10-year gap thanks to the 10-year rule and they're building a few things but not much they're doing a lot of experiments and then they start building after that when that's over in 1932 and the Royal Navy is based on a uh, basing on a war doctrine of 1942 to 45. The Germans are basing on a doctrine of 1948. The Italians also have a doctrine of they, they don't know when war's coming, but they don't think it's going to be that soon. The Americans are the same, so they're still in the arguably in the development stage, in the sort of the testing stage of development, whereas the Japanese are almost well, of course, thanks to the war Ch in China and various other things are on a war footing far earlier. So they start operating as if they're on a war footing far earlier, which affects their design practices. Did the Japanese have an Aztec system? I, they were developing something similar to an Aztec system, but they don't seem to have had one initially. Not one in, not in mass use, anyway. And they weren't really used much for ASW warfare. Hieroglyph. Pre-war, all our estimates of IJN forces and strikes were inaccurate due to secrecy more than disinformation, but also due to racism. Oh, there's even more than that. We'll get on to that. Ginger Ninja, 2611. The thing about these videos is I run the same rule for them as I run in my classes when I teach at university. There is no such thing as a stupid or a silly question. Because if it's an honest question, i.e. something you want to know, it's not a stupid or silly question. If it's something I... I don't know. If a student asked me about my personal life, I'd look at them and just give them a raised eyebrow and go, topic of discussion, please. But if it's something on topic, there is no such thing as a stupid or silly question. Because it's something you want to know. And the odds are, if you want to know it, other people want to know it. And if other people want to know it, then they benefit from you asking it. So it's always good to answer questions. So, you know, whenever you talk about 18-inch cruisers, I think about a cruiser that is 18-inch long. That is usually what the Daily Star works out of things about. Aragriff. IJN mm, cruisers and light cruisers were meant they were effective at recon, at least all the, till their float planes were all shut down. Mm. 
Andrew Cox, did the Japanese foresee any economic warfare role for their cruisers, especially in the event of war with the British Empire? Vast long range would seem to make the Obas ideal. It would seem to, but as I pointed out earlier, where is the British trade? It's all to the west of India. So are the Japanese ships going to get into the Mediterranean? Nope. And let's see, if they get into the Indian Ocean, well, they've then got past Singapore, which they're not really expecting to do. The Japanese, it's going to sound strange, Japanese strategy changes because it's what possible. They don't expect to get Fran French Indochina as quickly as they do. Because remember, their war strategy is they're thinking about war. And then there's the European war erupts, and eventually they have an alliance with Germany, and they manage to get French into China without a fight because Germany forces France to hand it over to them, and that suddenly gets them a lot closer to the British, and suddenly it changes the entire strategic scenario, and then they get to Singapore. If you're talking about plans in the 1920s and early 1930s, or even the late 1930s, the Japanese aren't thinking about getting past Singapore. They aren't thinking about getting as much into the Indian Ocean. If they get there, that's great. But first of all, they need a basis to get themselves there, and then they need to actually operate there. It's just not going to happen. So for them, economic warfare is a nice target to have, and it's something they'd like to go after, but it's not really pragmatic, because it's not really an option. Amphibious warfare? Now, that is something they should have been practicing more and support a ground trip to shore, but, you know. Hey ho. All right then, let's go on to. We're now onto the Miyoko class, and O one seventeen. I do love it. The fact is, I, I, I'm typing this into the thing down below, so it's got the timelines on it for people to be able to come and watch things. And it's always a case of, hope it works. Hope it works. So, the Miyoko class. And I would argue these are the first ones of the what become the proper Japanese heavy cruisers as the, you start to see the development uh, develop. Because A, this Ashigara there, which as you know, her and her sisters are famous in my book for the Singh Townsend in 1939. This is the the three, possibly four I'm fairly sure it was, only, it was it's definitely, I think it's three heavy cruisers at Singh Town 1939 and they are the sisters. I think it's Miyoko, Nachi, and Ashigara, but there is a debate over whether it could be Hagoro rather than Miyoko. Um, there. And they are ordered, as you can see, in 1924, October and November, Miyoko and Nachi, and then 1925, March and April, Hagoro and Ashigara. And usually Japanese, battle, uh, Japanese cruisers are built in pairs. And it's interesting that Ashigara is sunk by a Royal Navy submarine, HMS Trenchant. Um, Hagaro uh, is sunk in the Straits of Malacca by a Royal, uh, the Royal Navy's 26th destroyer flotilla. That's an interesting fight. Uh, Nashi is sunk by aircraft from the USS Lexington. And Miyoko is captured in September 1945 at Singapore. Hey ho. They displace 11,633 tons in standard. 14,980 tons in full load. So these are the first cruisers, and it's 1924. It's a long time before Japan officially breaks with the treaty. It's a long time before the Navy Party gets charged of the Japanese Navy, and Japan is already building ships which are definitely not fitting the treaty. They have a length of 669 feet overall, a beam of 64 feet, and a draft of 20.9 20 no, 20 .9 feet. They have the 12 Campon boilers, supplying four geared turbines to four shafts, uh, for a total of 130,000 shaft horsepower, for a top speed of 35.5 knots, and a range of 8,000 nautical miles at 14 knots. They have 10 8 inch guns, uh, 20 centimeter, that's 7.9 inch guns in five twin turrets, six single 4.7-inch guns, 12 610-millimeter guns in torpedo tubes, 
and various things. They will be modified as time goes on. Again, they will get the 8-inch gun upgrade. They will get the various things put in them. But this, to me, is the... The Japanese cruiser has now started to reach its point. It has three turrets forward and two aft. Now, here is my... First point about Japanese design. So, Japan, of course, is to an extent at this point obsessed with the Battle of Tsushima. Rightly or wrongly so. So, they're obsessed with crossing the enemy T. That is the only point at which this arrangement of your guns is actually of any use whatsoever. When you are broadside onto an enemy who is facing you. So when the enemy is the smallest target possible. Here is my little point. If you are going to buck the tonnage so much anyway, you might as well, if I'm not just an option, have gone with four treble turrets. Because at least then you've got six forward, six firing aft, and, you know, you've got your broadside of 12. But instead they've gone for a broadside of 10, and they have one one twin turret, which is actually, actually for its orientation, is orientated aft, cannot actually physically fire forward, despite being forward, and can't fire aft because it'll hit its bridge structure. So it literally can fire one side or the other, but is otherwise not much help. That turret is no earthly help whatsoever. You will never convince me otherwise. <laughs> I know, it gives them 10 guns. That's brilliant. They have 10 guns. But sticking, uh, changing the ship design around and sticking it between the funnels would be better, in my opinion, than sticking it there. Sticking it there, no help. Sticking it aft, doing two on the same level but ack, and then one high up. That would be more helpful, because then, it, yes, then it's still firing aft. But it, it, at least it's in a position to actually fire aft, rather than being forward and not being able to fire forward or aft. It's... It, 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 you're just putting on a turret to say you have a turret. Oh... <sighs> Okay. Invasion of China, well, there's one in 1937, but there's other ones going on. Basically, Japanese intervention in China starts in the 1920s and gets gradually more problematic from there onwards. And arguably, it was going on before then, but it's their actual open aggression. And the Seneca era, Daily Star, British newspaper that once did a whole front page about the Royal Navy's five inch destroy five inch guns on destroyers costing so much money, and only after they were corrected uh, didn't bother to ask anyone the question of what does five inch mean. They thought five inch was the length of the gun, not the cat and not the width of the gun, and then it was a caliber. They they just it's the uh, it's the dearth of specialist defense reporters. But there again, there's a dearth of specialist reporters in every subject. As we saw recently, the dearth of science reporters in COVID and various other things. Frederick Vega, where was the 3 inch belt protection at decent battle ranges uh, for the 5 inch? Hmm. Probably. Just didn't. Could we say the Japanese heavy cruisers with how they were designed were the true pocket battleships? Nope.
Hmm. Paragraph, the impression I get is that C, the best armor, is a larger gun to engage him at further range, so as not to get be hit in the first place. Uh, that's always the hope. Ammon, during the interwar period, did the IGN realize that the RN could strangle their trade and supply routes while avoiding a decisive battle? And what was their response to this problem? The Japanese understood it, but the Japanese idea was that the British would come forward to engage in the site of battle. And you have to remember the British did have a doctrine of going forward to impose blockade on Japan. So that was Japan's idea. However, the Royal Navy would have probably taken their time coming. And so that it would have been an interesting test of wills. There's also a difference in the doctrine of the British and the Amer uh, British and the Japanese in terms of night flying of aircraft and night strikes, which is one of those interesting things because when you put up British carriers, especially the illustrious class, versus their equivalents from Japan and America, everyone goes, "Well, yes, they're, they're going to lose," and you sort of go, "Well, they're going to lose if they manage to hit if those guys hit them first, but the British do night flying; these other ones don't." So if the British managed to find them at night, and the British reconnaissance doctrine is very long range and based off their carriers, kind of like the American one, the odds are they will find their enemy at night. And if they do find their enemy at night, as Operation C very nearly came, it depends on, it basically there is one, if there had been an, a small error of navigation had not happened in terms of them flipping sort of fig, uh, figures around then the Japanese could well have been attacked at night during Operation Sea during the Indian Ocean Raid. And then we could have a very interesting reading of history because the Japanese could have lost a couple of aircraft carriers. And then there's the question of would they sail around to try and fight the British during the day or would they try to have withdrawn? And it all depends on how, what you think Nagumo's state of mind is. And whether or not Somerville's going to hang around in the daytime to fly that thing, or if he's going to recover his aircraft and steam as far south as he can in the night, so he's nice and far away, so that the next day when they come hunting for him, he's he's nicely beyond range for them to likely to find him till possibly the end of the day. And if they don't find him before it gets uh, the, till it gets too late, then they don't get to launch, and the British might get to launch another one. But it's it's an it's an interesting turn of history. Andrew Cox, trying to figure out the Japanese strategy. No ability to impact trade. How do they hope to convince any enemy nation to make peace? They thought that by destroying the enemy's fleet, that would convince them to negotiate peace. Uh, Ginger Ninja 2611. Hager last stand against RN Destroyer is definitely something poor old Cumberland late has, uh, was late to the party again. Yes. HMS Cumberland, consistently late to the party. <sighs> she tried to be there. <laughs> Andrew Cox, the action of Hagaro was mit classic. It's also, also Renown missed that again. Too late for the plate. Too slow for Haragaro. Haguro. Yeah. She had fun. For renown. So close. Run Cash, you really need to keep the crew on the sea turret loyal and happy if you're the captain of the bridge staff. Pretty much. Um, Congressman, Miyoko's turret on fire. How would she have performed at River Plate? Not that great. What about the uh, Wing Hung Yin? What about the Brooklyn class? That's another rant to come and will come at some point. I will probably end up doing the American cruise as well. So, right, I have highlighted Sujin's 90 question and I'm going to highlight it because what I'm going to do is. Now it's the Turco class. So, again, shall we bet whether the. Uh, shall we say whether we think the Americans got it right or wrong in their estimations? So. Currently, they've listed the length as 657 feet overall, 62 feet beam, a uh, draft of about 19.8 feet, uh, eight feet, and displacement of 9,850 tons in standard. So, this is their, uh, their, their reckoning. 
Please tell me, do you believe they are right? And while you're answering that question, I'm going to, as you always, please put in the comment section if you think they're right, the Americans were right or wrong. I'm going to read uh, answer some comments. Um, okay, Sudrin, Sudrin 90. The Japanese favored multiple twins because they expected to be outnumbered and more turrets equal engage more targets. Yes, but that helps if you have a turret which can actually engage a target because it can actually find one. Um, could they be grouped any closer together? They tried. Frederick Vega, who had the first idea with Brooklyn or Japan? Every, uh, Japan uh, they both had it at the same time, roughly. Um, Eamon, I have to go, so a uh, study for glasses. Take care, Eamon. Glad to answer your question. Good luck with the glasses. Um, Andrew Cox, Jemek, as Mahan pointed out, winning the naval battle gives you command of the sea, but then you need a strategy for how to use that command to win the war. And as both Mahan and Corbett point out, that is the first, uh, you, need, you need that strategy. Animal 16 Reef Guys, remember, this is the same Navy that tried to prove Archimedes wrong. Hmm. Nova Topaz, 9,600 tons. Oh boy, is that 2,000 tons short? I'm pretty sure. Hmm. Um, JP, JPDT19, I strongly suspect right in someone else and wrong in weight and welding speed. Hmm. That's actually, are we going to discuss how artistic are double forward turrets on Japanese cruisers? I really like how they look. Uh, probably not. They they did look pretty in some respects. Um, uh, Marcus Amazon, also a Christian, but do you know if Tribal's Battle of the Rings is going to come out as a digital book? I move around lots, so don't really like a human physical book looks when possible. It is Marcus. It is supposed to be coming out as a digital book. Captain C4, uh, did anyone get a chance pre-war to make a good estimate of an IGN cruiser's real size in a similar way to the estimate the Iron was able to make of the Gozia? Yes. <laughs> Okay, let's see what the results are. Were the US right or wrong? The US were wrong! Displacement, 11,350 tons standard as built. So that's about 2,000 tons out. And um, they were close to 15,500 tons when they were fully loaded. They were also longer. Ah, oh, lovely times. But they do look pretty. They do look pretty. Oh. And 35 minutes. Hello. Uh, hello. You should be definitely wrong, but what data do they have to work with? Interesting enough, the British do get theirs consistently, uh, do tend to get their estimates slightly righter. But the British have a secret advantage to this. It's called the China Station Squadron. And every time they manage to get into port with the Japanese, they take photos of their ships along as close as they can to the Japanese ships so they can be compared. So the estimates the British get are mostly not from human uh, human sources, which are going around, going and look, sort of looking at them. They're mostly from naval officers taking pictures of their own ships next to the Japanese ships, because that is what the China Station Squadron seems to exist for to do. And then they have some naval engineers do some calculations. <laughs> So, I like this class, but I will point out they do like to change their, techno uh, their tech. So, their initial is supposed to be 10 8 inch guns in five twin turrets in the same load as before. And as I said again, I am really not a fan of C turret. And they have eight 61 centimeter torpedo tubes in two quadruple, in four twin launchers, and all these sort of things as initially. However, the final, well, I had the final for Tego and Atago, and I have the final for Maya. And the final for Shokai is disputed. So, I haven't put that there. But, for Tego and Atago, it's 10 guns in five twin turrets, 
and you go forward and they have four quad launchers and eight reloads for a total of 24 type 93 torpedoes plus depth charges carried yes the japanese believe that their heavy cruisers would get involved in depth charging submarines we can all be slightly worried by that concept yes depth charging submarines anyone want to actually do that with a cruiser please don't Hmm. Now. The interesting thing is, of course, the Maya, who still has four quad torpedo launches, but doesn't carry any reloads, and also goes down to eight. To, uh, tw uh, uh, eight. 8 inch uh, turrets, which to me seems sensible, especially when I look her up. Um, but you have to admit. It's <sighs> pretty much what they do is they get rid of one of her um, eight-inch turrets and replace it with AA armament because that's what they need. And this is the the story of the AA armament is the story of these ships because. The Atago, Atako and Atago have 60 Type 96 25mm. And Maya has 66. In 13 triples, 27 sing and 27 singles. And 36 Type 93 machine guns. 12 5 inch dual purpose and 6 twin turrets. Originally, she was supposed to have 4 Type 10 12 centimeter high angle guns. Uh, so that's 120 millimeter, and she changes to 125. And she goes from 4 to uh, 12. That's a big increase in AA power. And that's really what these cruisers are doing, is that some of the cruisers, by the end, are becoming floating AA batteries for the carrier battle groups, etc. And that's perfectly reasonable and perfectly sensible. But it's again, it's a problem of their design and construction, in that the Japanese have been very obsessed with putting on the most guns possible. And someone has earlier pointed out that this is because they wanted to engage as many targets as possible because they thought they were going to fight outnumbered. And that's true. They did think they were going to fight outnumbered. But. And I will put this simply. That extra twin turret doesn't really help you. The Japanese are not. Beyond wit, incapable of developing a treble turret. They are not. They could develop a treble turret. And I would argue that four treble turrets, if they're going to lie, they could probably get, if they can get away with lying and having five twin turrets when everyone else seems to struggle to mount four twin turrets on the, tur on the 3T tonnage limit. And the British, of course, get around it by having. The ability to magically put armor into their ships and all sorts of things. Wonder where all that armor was stored. Hmm, all these naval dockyards. Oh, where is the armor stored? Um, the the point is, if the Japanese are going to lie, you might as well lie properly, and they could have had twelve 
8 inch guns. They could have had 4 treble turrets. And yes, they could have slowly engaged 4 targets theoretically rather than 5. But let's put it this way. Think of where that ship can actually engage. A fifth target off to your port or starboard. So you're broadside on to five enemy cruisers. And you're going against the entire history of doctrine, a doctrine that you've been, uh, that anyone's been fighting, which is you concentrate your guns on one target, destroy, move on to the next target. Why do you do that? Because if you fire a full salvo, a salvo at one target, you probably guarantee a hit. If you fire a single turret, a single twin turret at one target, you're very likely to miss. And again, it's you want to increase you if you want to increase your chances of hitting your target and taking out your target, you actually want to increase your number of guns. So in which case, four times three increases your number of guns. And you could probably do that on the same hull they're building. Triple. Treble. Both mean three. Ducklin 95. Hi, the clock. First steel was cut on the first Type 31 HMS Ventura today. Who in the Far East is an underrated, uh, rated Navy, underrated Navy in your opinion? Um, underrated Navies in the Far East. We often ignore the South Korean one. They do some quite cool ships. Uh, in the Europe, it's Italy. Always, consistently, Italy gets underrated as a Navy. I don't know why. They produce very good ships. Um... The Indian Navy tends to get more attention because it's bigger now, but um, Singaporean and Malaysian navies are also fairly good and very interesting ships. Take care, John Evans. Good luck getting the kids to bed. Um, Andrew Cox, did they have fire control to engage more than two targets simultaneously? Not really. They have it theoretically. If you consider all the fire control units they have in the turrets and in various other positions, they have it theoretically. But actually doing it requires a lot of crew and a lot of train crew. And what are Jap is Japan consistently short of? Train crew. I'll ask you, wouldn't a triple 8-inch turret need a bigger barbette and thus a wider hull, and thus speed would fall as a result? To be fair, considering how far forward they're having to stick the forward turret in this configuration, and in various other scenarios they're doing, you could pro probably wouldn't be that much of a wider hull. And probably would the guns would be mounted slightly further back. James D, why was this the first class built with 8-inch from the start? When were the others retrofitted and how significant was the difference? Seems high cost for low benefits. It's mainly about standardizing your logistics that you're doing the difference. And also, the 8-inch gun that you get has a... Uh, the 8-inch gun that they fit to replace the 7.9 has... is slightly longer, slightly more powerful, and there's various factors which feature into it to actually make it a, a slightly better... A, a more... a better gun. And you're allowed to do it. It's legal, so you might as well do the upgrade. It's basically the Japanese perspective. Um, right, let's just check. Um, Taco was, um... Captured in Singapore, um, 
Atago was blown up by USS Data. Maya was sunk uh, was um, sunk by USS Dace, and Chokai was disabled in the Battle of Samar and sunk by the destroyer Fujinami. And now, <coughs> now we have the Megami class. Oh, this is going to be fun. So, as before, do we think, while I'm answering comments, that ONS got this right? Do we think the ONS were right when they said that their displacement was 8,500 tons, officially? But 14,000 tons was their estimate. Now, they've got an estimate there. They've got themselves two shots. And their length is 639 meters overall. Uh, beam. I cannot read it up here, but draft is 14.9. I'm going to have to swap it to screens if I'm going to try and read that. Let's look at the crew thing. Right. Uh, Abzowski, uh, you can shift the turret further back in uh, back in the bow where the hull is wider. Yeah, as I said. Uh, um, 2611. I wonder if the reason for sticking with a twin 8 inch rather than the, the tri uh, triple is commonality of parts. Certainly was probably part of it, but they could have upgraded. A line had x right. The Italian Navy know how to make a good looking ship. That is, they are very effective at their job. They are. Wolf, the uh, 12 war. Hello, Wolf. Uh, one, uh, Dr. Clark. To me, you put far too much faith in the ability for a night strike to work without any real world examples of it working. Uh, especially to find that attacks at Fleet C were mutual supporting AA fire. The only time that we see a swordfish under Fleet AA fire is the channel dash. It didn't all go well for them. Um, well, to be fair, the channel dash was in daylight, not night. And that didn't go well for them because they had no support at all, and it was just them against a lot of German aircraft and German ships. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that didn't go well for them. Plus, at that point, they were 1939. In Operation C, the uh, attacking aircraft would have been albacores, which were slightly better. Not enough to really justify exchanging, but they were slightly better. And considering the attacks on Bismarck and various other things, which are various other night operations and night attacks flown, yeah, the Royal Navy had fairly good experience about it. And I'm saying it's a what if. It's, you know, it's a, if they attack, they could well have taken out some carriers because, again, Japanese carriers don't have the best damage control. Dr. Lanifant also just read Indonesia has ordered two Type 31s as well. Yes, they have. Japanese have interesting ship names. They do, Tian Wong. They do. Congress, Megami is a fun one in World of Warships, or at least uh, was a few months ago since I didn't log in. Hmm. Hello, Kieran Evans. Declan. Oh god, not the Megamis. <laughs> okay. The estimate feels more accurate, though dimensions is anyone's guess. Estimate's closer, but still wrong, I think, from Neovo Topaz. Andrew Cox. Why did they trunkle the funnels together for the Megamis rather than stick with two from the previous classes? I have no idea, because they want to make it look weird. I... It just looks weird to me. It honestly does. It's giving them a sort of hunchback appearance. But I do prefer the turret design. I, I like the fact that they've gone for... And actually that makes sense because now all three forward turrets can fire forward. It's useful. Ah, stuff or something. Wasn't it a Megami class that took about a PT-109? It could have been. Right now. So, let's see. Were they right or wrong? They were, of course, sort of right. In that 8,500 tons standard is what they claimed. Now, the interesting thing about the Megami class, of course, is that they actually come out really in two classes. And their full load 
is kind of interesting because their final displacement, and this is the point that gets interesting, because I've got up here their standard as built was eight and a half thousand tons. Their final was thirteen thousand six hundred and seventy tons. Their final. Their final full load was somewhere in the region of eighteen thousand tons. That was they were theoretically capable of taking on stores and everything after that rare they could carry that and that's again some of the uh, that's not a, actually an agreed figure in this one that's an agreed figure in a british estimate so the final agreed figure is somewhere in the region of i uh, well you see the thing is the displacement grew by five thousand tons from eight and a half to thirteen thousand uh, final displacement the full load, the, it, people, some say it grows by nearly 18,000 tons, it's 7,000 tons of growth of that one. If you consider the final, uh, the displacement has gone up by 5,000 tons, and the initial full load was already 2,500, well, yeah, 2,500 tons, roughly more than that. So we'd be going with a full load that once all the stores, etc., are in there, it's gone up to roughly another four, uh, gone up to four and a half thousand tons. It does seem to vary between three thousand and four and a half thousand tons that are various figures given. So eighteen thousand tons is the highest range. Some books go lower, and it's a reckoning in about sixteen and a half thousand tons. Now. Originally, five, triple. Well, six inch guns. Let's be honest, one, five, five. And eventually replaced by five twin eight inch guns. Which explains their massive weight increase because when you go from a six inch turret and the level of industry it needs to support it to an eight inch turret, that's going to throw up your weight quite dramatically. Yes, these are the cruisers which started off life as light cruisers. Yeah. That was a light cruiser. Now. Here is my interesting take on this one. I honestly think they were probably a better fit for the Japanese Navy as light cruisers than they were as heavy cruisers. Because as light cruisers, they have overwhelming firepower forwards. And you can really organize the aviation facilities. Now, I've left aircraft blank because here is the point. At various points, these ships position in participate in various raids. And as we can see on the back here, they have quite extensive aviation facilities between these two catapults. At various points, they can apparently carry between 3 and 11 Ashi E-13A float planes. Now, I helpfully do have a picture of an Ashi, which I'm going to put up. Now, if I can find it, he says. That's always the interesting question. Can he find it? Can he find it? Did it did it? I have it. I don't have that one. Not um, that one. Yay! There it is. It's come up a bit bigger than I thought it was going to come up, but that'll do. And. This is the really critical thing for the Japanese, because you have to remember the critical point for their cruisers is they're their reconnaissance assets. That's what they are for. That is what they are part of in wartime. That is what they're supposed to provide them with, reconnaissance. And these cruisers are about that. Now, I would say... It's almost a waste of weight. If you're going to make such a cruiser so focused on reconnaissance, I, it's the equivalent almost of a town class. 
at that point. It would have been better to have used that extra displacement for more fuel, that space for more fuel, for more AA we weaponry, and maybe some general purpose weaponry, i.e. increasing the number of 5-inch guns they carried, and increasing the aviation facilities. Because they have two catapults, and they can carry 11 aircraft. Well, in the nicest way, you could have perhaps taken off what I would call X turret, left Y, and suck a third catapult over Y on X, in the position where X was, and could have probably started carrying about 12 aircraft. And when you consider the purpose of the cruisers, again, these are their reconnaissance assets to make the Kantai Kesson possible, because the whole point of the Kantai Kesson is the decisive battle, which they're building their fleet around, and the only way can they can achieve the decisive battle is if they are managing to wear down the American fleet or wear down the British fleet and then manage to gauge them with overwhelming superiority. Is it me or does that not require on a large amount of intelligence and being able to keep track of your enemy? Which means you need to be able to launch aircraft at regular intervals to take over from other shadowing aircraft so you can keep a constant shadow on the enemy. In simple terms, upgunning these ships doesn't help you achieve that. Adding more aircraft does. Andrew Cox, the hull looks uh, horribly narrow around the foremost magazines. I wonder if they fit any protect uh, torpedo protection at all. Mm, they had something, but not much. Okay, never mind. I'm both right and wrong. That's a good thing to be in history. That's what most historians are most of the time. Both right and wrong. Tobias Geoffrey, of course it was a light cruiser. They were horrendously unstable. <laughs> I'm going in order of the cruisers being built, so tone class are possibly are probably the next one up. Um Congressman. Megami with triple one four five versus twin uh, two hundred three again. World warships so it might not be historically accurate, correct, but their one four fives did not have the rate of fire of USN, RN, and even German one five two. I would say, I would uh, maybe crowded triple turrets or something too, or just world warship generals. In the crowded triple turrets, perhaps. I would say rate of fire of USN and RN potentially, but I would also say there is part of me that wonders with their turret design whether they don't fudge it because they're planning on changing to doubles anyway. They've always already got that in mind when they're building them, so why bother producing a decent turret? It's never going to actually be used in war. It's just a turret for holding place. In which case, it's a waste of many, many things. Ninja 2611. If I remember correctly, which I usually don't, they rebuild them after they were damaged in a storm. I think another class. Um, most of the destroyers went through that, and some of their aircraft carriers were damaged in storms and had to be rebuilt. But the Japanese lot had a major instance where they lost several destroyers because they were, um, how do I put it, top heavy. And this incident leads to a lot of design reevaluations going through many, many classes. In car, can you realistically operate anything like this number of float plane aircraft from catapults? You can. But you have to remember you're at that point considering the float planes extent expendable. You're carrying that many because you consider them expendable. And in which case the other thing is if you're using this as a reconnaissance cruiser, which they seem to be using, then use it as a reconnaissance cruiser and, and emphasize on the reconnaissance. The moment you're focusing in on the 8-inch guns, you're actually undermining your role as a reconnaissance cruiser. Because an 8-inch tron cruiser is a very valuable asset, which you don't want to lose. Because 
it's going to be useful for any line of battle operations because that's what everyone's heavy cruisers are. Whereas a six inch cruiser, you're prepared to risk. This is the other thing the Royal Navy work out very quickly. Hang on, if we risk an 18 inch cruiser, that's going to be expensive if it goes down in morale and other things. Whereas six inch cruisers, going to be a lot of them. And some of them are probably going to be more expendable than others. Let's be honest. If the Royal Navy had to pick, if they had to pick on what cruiser to lose, and it was a county class or an air refuser, um, the four air refuser would probably be the one sacrificed. The or a county class or a town class. Well, the county class is the big premier heavy in heavy cruiser. That's the eight inch cruiser. County a town class is a twelve inch cruiser. You don't want to lose either, but if you're going to lose one. You've got far more ta far, far more light cruisers coming through than you have heavy cruisers. Andrew Cox, the triples did make it onto Yamato as a secondary, so I get the impression mainly because they were lying around. Pretty much. What's wrong? Uh, Wolf Toll War. Dr. Clark, the Japanese did have trained twin engine night flying that scored us few successes, notably the USS Chicago, but overall it's not very effective as finding the target in the dark is not easy. Agreed, but they did that's twin engined night flying aircraft, and that's not flying off their carriers. That's a different that's a different point. They do later in the war have some night carrier aviation, and the same the US Navy. But as said, the the Royal Navy has the advantage. They start the war with 100% night flying capability of the fleet air arm. And they finish the war doing their level best to maintain that capability. But it has reduced as war has gone on and because of the risk to air crew. Because night flying is dangerous for the air crew. And you have enough with attrition of fighting a war without losing any through night flying just because you want to keep up the skill set. Don Giovanni, presumably your scouting line is going to meet the enemy scouts. Don't you want local superiority? Well, if you're carrying 11 scout planes, I hope you're not going to meet the enemy scouts. I hope you're going to spot them and be able to skirt round them. But if you do meet them, the enemy scouts are most likely going to be 6-inch light cruisers. If you consider they're the Royal Navy, that's going to be town-class light cruisers. In which case, you have... 12, 12 six-inch guns. They have 12 six-inch guns. Enjoy. But honestly, the point is, with you, the number of scout planes you've got, this thing should have been able to avoid them. And it would also have been fairly useful as a surface radar. Cascadian, thank you. Right then. So we all seem to be quite keen on getting to the tone class. So let's move on to the tone class. Oi, caramba. The tones. Now, I haven't been able to find... Well, rather... How do I put this? The, uh, the Americans seem to change the tone class right up quite a lot in World War II. So, for whatever reason, mainly. Because they're terrible. Um, so, you know, these are the things that plague us, so I can't do my previous thing, but they are able to carry up to six float planes. They have a displacement of 11,213 tons in standard, uh, 15,200 tons in full load. <coughs> I'm not really sure I agree with that figure, but okay, we'll carry on. Um, there are lots of people who seem to be content with that figure, so we'll leave that there. I'm not sure I am content, uh, especially not when I look at sort of the fact that they have a 5.7 inch belt of armor. They have between 2.6 and 1.2 inch on the deck. They're carrying eight 203 millimeter guns in four twin turrets, eight five inch guns in four twin turrets, 12 type 96 25 millimeters in six twin mounts, and that's as they're originally fitted. That, that figure does change. And four triple 610mm torpedo tubes. Hmm. 
we can always have fun. But no, the tone class are interesting. And of course, here is the ultimate point about these cruisers. And honestly, I have got a lovely picture up here. You will see the lovely picture of Shikuma, which is from the front. And that's one of the most detailed and beautiful pictures we have of this class. But that's not really a good point for illustrating what is their piece the resistance of design flavor. Now, let's see. Can I get this up? Yeah. Whereas this lovely picture of Tone, herself, does illustrate it. Have you seen it? Yes! All four turrets forward! Yay! Aren't we pretty? And we have our aviation facilities at the back. This is the cruiser version of the battle carrier. We have guns front, aviation back. Guns at the front, aviation at the back. We have no ability to fire any of these guns really aft because unless we are zigzagging, which is going to slow down our rate of progress and egress, uh, we can carry six float planes. So we have lost that ability for the ability to carry six float planes. And by the way, in terms of guns firing forward, well, we have these forward two can fire forward. This one can't fire forward. And this one can theoretically fire forward if it fires over these, uh, over those two. And this gun manages to angle its turret, its gun, uh, its barrels out of the way. Because normally those two are stowed pointing aft towards the bridge. Right then, let's answer some questions on this lovely class. Mm -hmm. You see, this is why academics really shouldn't be given the ability to do YouTube videos. Because it, all I am now thinking is that I am in, I don't know, uh, what's that, that DIY comedy years ago? The guy who was sitting over the other side of the fence. <sighs> Trying to run the show. Anyway, all I'm thinking is now I'm him staring over the fence. Hello. Tony, thank you. Tien Wong, any idea what the Hakura is based in World of Warships is based on? Not really. Well, I have a theory, but I, I haven't really played enough of it myself to really be happy with that. Yes, it is a scout cruiser, and again, it's their heavy cruiser. This is the point. The Japanese are trying to make this fulfill both the reconnaissance brief and the supporting the battle line brief. And I would argue that because of this line out, it can't do either. Ginger Ninja. Look at the tonnage of some armored cruisers. Do you think that the high tonnage size of the Japanese cruisers are more in line with what we would see if their treaty hadn't happened? Sorry for the wall. Uh, don't worry. Um, potentially, yes. But I think potentially if you'd had armoured cruisers as an actual category that the heavy cruiser had been based on rather than the new light cruisers being the, ba the basis of the new heavy cruisers. Um, I, if the Hawkins class hadn't said it, but I don't know, some of the armoured classes had. Um, Black Prince or Warrior or Duke of Edinburgh class, etc. had set the limit, had set the standards for um, heavy cruisers. I think you might have seen some very interesting designs. Because they would have had to do a lot less compromises, especially. Although, if they'd been working on not up to 10 inch guns, that would have been interesting because the 10 inch gun, everyone would hate it. Because 10 inch gun, 250 millimeters, is just big enough to be annoying on the same level as 12 inch. And yet, just small enough to not be as helpful as a 12 inch. So you would probably find the uh, the Brit uh, people like the British, etc., would be going with a 9.2-inch gun. 
they just it would just be a lot easier and by that i mean uh 240 millimeter probably weapon system uh zachary again d-o-y-s-s no not d-o-y-s-o-s um american comedy program Toolman? Home Improvements. Yeah. It's from that. And it had... Um, I'm trying to remember who the guy was... Uh, who was hid behind the cut of the thing. Hmm. Hmm. I remember, but the guy was also, I think, uh, the guy who did the hiding behind was also on the Gilmore Girls, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Jack Ray, mutiny is like, uh, Tony, uh, Tony is like a mullet haircut. Business up front, party in the back. You, you just brought a mullet haircut onto my YouTube channel. I, I'm. There is part of me which is seriously distressed about you now, Jack. Seriously. Um, a cousin for HMS Furious in Halo form. Potentially, yes. Photo from the front. Sea state doesn't look high, but waves are coming up to deck. Doesn't look good for saying building perspectives. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> Let's put it this way: the uh, turret number four likes to swim in some of the other photos. I'm ruined. Tobias Jeffrey, she's pretty, and she found the American carriers at midway using her scouts. That's the only defense I can muster from. Design says it all. Yes, well, that's the point. It, that the she's a scout cruiser, and that's fine. If you're going to build a very big eight-inch arm scout cruiser, that's what you're going to end up with. But again. Three treble turrets could have been quite easy. Considering her being three treble turrets could have been quite easily put in. You could have gone A, B, and C. You could have done a forward version of what you see. Uh, you know, could have done exactly a repeat of the Megami class. That would have been good. And in the treble eight inch, that's fine. And then you've got nine eight inch guns instead of eight. And they're fine. It would have made three turrets would have made a lot more sense. But John, you don't want me to battle line with all those planes, shells, and gasoline. They're not good. No, they're not. Yeah, Mike. Also, theoretical fantasy tonery fits in the fifties or sixties may be truly bizarre. Imagine replacing some turrets with rocket launchers and putting helicopter hangers and deck on the back. Actually, the helicopter hangers and deck on the back would probably make a good use of them. And replacing, you see, I'd be tempted if I was doing a 1950s, 1960s refit to level up that bow, replace it and make it a lot stronger so I wouldn't have the treaties to deal with. And probably putting, uh, using, the tra uh, using the two existing forward turrets and then replacing these turrets with a raised section which has the missiles launching out of. Brent Bullets. Wilson, thank you, Brent. Off to a wall. It's just, uh, it's just a wild night strike on the Japanese cloud would work, uh, work its significant risk, in my opinion, has a low chance of success. Um, would work, it has a, cl uh, could work, it's a significant risk. Yes, it is a significant risk, but in, it's one of those things that if it is launched, that, that's the thing. It's a risk Somerville decides to take. It's launched. And if it hadn't been for that air navigation, it would have happened. That's why there are very few what ifs that Jamie Seidel of Armored Carriers and he's really on Build Trumps, etc., will actually debate. He doesn't like doing what if history. He will debate that one, though, because actually Somerville did launch and did intend to hit. So it's worthwhile examining. And the point is, if they had hit, if they say, let's say, get two carriers, which is what they know where they are, they take out two. Of course, there are a lot more than two Japanese carriers there. So then you have the day to fight. And if the day, if the day doesn't, if there isn't a fight during the day, 
Depends on if Nagumo decides to hang around or if decides to move away. If there is a if there is a if they do manage to launch a strike, they then have, of course have the problem that the British air defense doctrine is far different than the American one. Their fighter control is very different than the American one due to their experiences in the Mediterranean. So they are dealing with Mediterranean veterans, which is going to be a very different scenario. And that's a fully functioning British battle, carrier battle group. So they might, again, they would outnumber them in aircraft, but they would be dealing with an air group which is full of veterans. And if that's if they find them first thing in the morning. The odds are the British have been racing far away. They're going to be doing their best to evade. So they're probably not going to find them until later in the day, which means they might get to launch one strike. And if they're then in strike range, because they launch one strike, then the British get to launch another strike that night. So if they haven't taken out the British carriers, then the British launch a second night strike and the Japanese probably lose even more ships. And then it becomes another battle the next day, and who knows what happens. It's one of those points of history which is worth looking at for the lessons it could, it can teach you about what could have happened, but it is an entirely theoretical discussion. And I agree. I don't think everything... And this is one of the things that I find funny. Whenever I talk about it, everyone always assumes I think everything's going to go to British way. I don't think it will necessarily think it will do. I do argue that case sometimes when I'm with Jamie, but that's because he's going to put the other side so strong, so well that I articulate the other side so we have a discussion rather than us sitting there agreeing the whole time. So that's not really interesting for the listeners and not really educational for anyone. So that is the point of that one. The Japanese reconnaissance cruisers, well, this is what they are for. They're reconnaissance cruisers, but in that case, don't fit eight inch guns. Senator Nero, do not say that. Andrew Cox, the first video I saw of Rodney was at a similar angle to Chikama, and for ages I thought it was uh, uh, such a, she was such a graceful ship. <laughs> mm. One or two, and risk the only force the British have to stop any further advances, though the Japanese would never get a come, uh, never get an opportunity. I believe that denying a battle was the best choice at the time. Uh, again, as said, that's the, that's a perfectly valid point to make. And that's what happened. But the thing is, Somerville almost doesn't. Uh, but a risk of thing. Uh, but a uh, navigation error. And the point is... Yes, you're preserving the fleet, but you're also preserving the fleet. The Japanese are actually attacking into your territory. And who knows, they won't come again. So, yes, you're preserving your fleet, hopefully going to be stronger to deal with them if they come again, and that's what the Eastern Fleet does grow, and eventually becomes the British Pacific Fleet when it's transferred over. But it's a case of... It would have been very interesting if it had happened. And, of course, then you end up with the other history of if the Japanese fleet is severely damaged. Let's say Nagumo loses two carriers, decides it's not worth it. The Indian Ocean is not worth it. Which is, I think, is honestly what he could decide and decides to get that out of Dodge, then the British have a lovely victory to talk about that doesn't really gain them much strategically because they've just kicked the Japanese out of the ocean and they still got to deal with Japanese submarines. But it does give us another carrier battle to talk about in World War II. And my suspicion, strong suspicion, is the British sink one or two carriers at night and the Japanese decide to get out, go, get out of there. Because they don't know what kind of force they're facing. That's the other thing for the Japanese. If they're attacked at night, you are quite easily can quite easily overestimate the number of aircraft you're facing, and they could quite easily think that they're facing a far larger British, um, ro uh, British uh, carrier battle, uh, British uh, force than they are actually facing. Because their belief is that that there are virtually no British forces out there, so a carrier strike at all is going to scare the bejesus out of them. Our recon cruisers, how much emphasis was placed on force recon, i.e. doing recon and mop-up of edible targets themselves and crippled enemy after battle? Not really. It was the destroyers which were supposed to um, 
uh, how to put it, mop up edible targets after battle, uh, if there were any. And honestly, that's the problem. If you're using the cruisers as force reconnaissance, then they need to carry less aircraft and more fire and better distribution of firepower. Now, this is what happens to the last Japanese heavy cruiser. The Ibukai gets turned into an aircraft carrier. And probably this is the point which they should have been making from the beginning, because if they really wanted a reconnaissance cruiser, that's what they should have been building. I'm sorry, someone's just come to my door. I'll be back in a second. And ultimately, this is testimony to the sheer amount of air power that they're building into their cruisers, that something like this can be made so easily of a heavy cruiser. A fairly decent aircraft carrier can be built of a heavy cruiser because it already has so much, so many, it's such an extensive air fit. Now, of course, Ibukai herself doesn't actually get to do much. Um, she technically is convert as I said, she's converted into a light aircraft, and really, she is a complete. Uh, she is a, a copy of the Megami class. She is a repeat of the Megami class. That's what she's designed to be. And originally she was supposed to be, of course, able to carry 11 aircraft. And, well, they start upgrading that, upgrading it, upgrading it. As designed, she was going to be 12,000 tons in displacement. And she was going to have um, various radars, including a Type 93 hydrophone system for anti-submarine warfare. And a Type 2 Mark II Model 1 air search radar. And she's going to carry 10 8 inch guns. However, by the time she becomes an aircraft carrier, things are different. She's carrying a lot more aircraft than she was originally going to, and is a lot more capable, as I, as I think as an air estimate assistant. Um, <sighs> would have been interesting. And of course in this she's like the American cruisers which became aircraft carriers and various other ships. 
which had the conversion in world time to aircraft carriers. It's a recognition of the need of aircraft carriers. It's also a recognition of the need of reconnaissance carriers. So you can argue that Japan might have been better pursuing more aircraft carriers from the beginning, because that's what they really seem to have needed their aircraft carriers for. Well, their, uh, their cruisers for was reconnaissance. We've got there. Hello, Richard. Good evening, Ralph Shepherds. Eboki. Eboki. Well, I wonder what the loss rate of the CIJ and cruiser scout aircraft as war went on, and what part of that was due to radar. A lot was due to radar. Uh, Roland Cash. Sorry, Dr. Clark and everyone. My Supreme Leader has told me she wants to watch TV now. Take care. Take care and look after your Supreme Leader. Hello, barmaid. Andrew Cox. Masses of carrier base fighters and radar di uh, directed to VT to uh, a few shells. Yeah. Those wings aft look weird. Oh, trust me, they're not the weirdest part of this ship. It has many sponsor positions, etc., for various reasons on the ship. And, well, yeah. It's not in a good place. Andrew Cott, uh, I'm sure they could have kept A and B turrets under the flight deck forward. Would make m m m as much sense as a tone. Don't joke, because... Let me read out the figures that she's fitted for as an aircraft carrier. Now, Ibukai aircraft carrier. I get those figures up. Uh, I have them in here. Um, sorry. It's when you can't find it in your notes and you're going, hang on, I know it's in something here. Well, barmaid, hello and welcome. Um, is, barmaid, is this also streaming on Twitch? No, it isn't because I haven't set up a Twitch account. But people keep asking me to set up a Twitch account, so I'm going to consider it. And whether I, uh, for start uh, for starters, I don't do I, I don't do gaming. I do do just do naval history, which is the thing. Um, my limitations probably, but you know. Turning to my trusty little book. Ibukai, 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 Ibukai. Tones of Ibukai is a very good aircraft carriers. Dun, 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 dun. Actually, no, no. Escort carriers. Unruh class. It's in here somewhere, I know. But actually finding it is the interesting one. Hi. Mm -hmm. In the end, someone omits. They just turn to the index. Nope. No mention of Ibuka. Ah, well. Um, the reason I was looking around was because actually she retained her 8-inch guns. I think... Those are the forward. From what I remember reading, the forward pit twins you can see um, that are sort of very, very obviously on the sponsons, and they're quite different designs, were 8-inch guns. I'm not sure why I think that, but from memory of looking through the notes, those were 8-inch guns.
Um, Or they might have been, well, hang on, were they? Hmm, no, because those are the 76 millimeters. They might have been 76 millimeters, but I, I, there is part of me which thinks that they were, it, it, she were, those were a, her eight inch, they were legacy 8 inch guns they were planning on putting them, but I might be wrong. I'm just, I, I, I know I read it somewhere, but I cannot remember where. Senator you could do patentically playing Water Warships. I know a channel that did that where I said it's going to read. Mm. Um, yeah, me playing Water Warships is not particularly nice to people. Uh, I actually, this is the trouble. I am probably not the world's best World of Warships player. But that's probably because I try and use the ships as accurately to real world as possible, rather than how it's probably best and how you're supposed to use them in World of Warships. Which means I tend to hang around with my battleships on the edge of the map, blasting people from range and wiping out small things, and then everyone tries to come and hunt me down and dies painfully. Andrew Cox, they look small for an 8-inch. Yeah, it could well be, but it's just, I know at one, I'm not sure if they, it might not be on this drawing, I might be wrong completely, but I do know, I remember reading that they were, she was going to be fitted with a tw with twin 8 inch, one either side. She was also going, uh, the, that drawing could well be the twin 76 millimeter guns, the 3 inch guns. Um, but again, it was getting far more and far more firepower, but she is, an aircraft carrier by this point. So that's the evolution. It's basically gone from, well, as you can see, the doctrine has taken them from cruisers, which are definitely cruisers, through aviation reconnaissance to aircraft carriers, because eventually, if you are emphasizing that much on aircraft based reconnaissance, that is the better fit for you than a cruiser. However, it wasn't just the course. They're heavy cruisers which suffered from this fun. This is the light cruiser class, which I thought wouldn't be quite interesting to compare to the Aganos. And the Aganos are pretty. They are pretty. But you're going to guess very quickly what my problem is with them. Although, I do understand this. These are also reconnaissance cruisers. They are. And as such, they are fitted with a, a reconnaissance cruisers. But they are built in 1940, 1941, and 1942. Let's go just into that. The Japanese are well out of the treaty by this point. They are limited. They are building though something which is seven and a half thousand tons fully loaded, which is quite limited in terms of fact. Although it has eight thousand nautical miles at eighty knots, so that's quite good, and a top speed of thirty-five knots. But they have six one five two in three twin turrets. You can see the two forward. You can. There is also a single turret aft. Okay. But this is your reconnaissance light cruiser. Where does this fit? Is it supposed to be a destroyer leader? But then why has it got the reconnaissance assets? And it's got two float planes, one catapult. So that's not much reconnaissance. And it's just got six. You have left the treaty. 
if there's you have got treble six inch turrets available you know this is theoretically time wise equivalent not too dissimilar to the crown colonies which the British are building under war conditions and the Japanese are building these under war conditions, but they're not yet in war. They're building, it's starting them in 1940. These are launched in 1940. This one, Agano, is launched in 1941, October 1941. War for the Japanese with the Americans, when it becomes problematic, doesn't begin until December 1941, when they start it. Again, you would expect them to have they know war is coming. They have started deciding on war a lot earlier than this. They have been heading towards that uh, down that path. They've been doing all sorts of meetings, as I covered in the Chiefs of Staff um, videos. All sorts of meetings, all sorts of discussions. Why? Why have they not prepared better? Why are they not churning out a better light cruiser? They have been out of the treaty now at this point. By almost, for almost five years, they've been sort of leaving or out of the treaty. You would expect a better light cruise on this. You would expect a seriously better light cruise on this to be coming out of the Japanese, and should have been coming out of the Japanese. Andrew Cox, Wiki says eight centimeter, uh, uh, three inch. Could you be getting mixed up? No, I don't think I am, Andrew. I'm fairly sure it's an it's in. Uh, as I said, I'm fairly sure it's in one of the books I read that they consider they were planning on keeping at one uh, planning on keeping definitely at one point, if not on final, the eight inch guns. I'm not sure which book it is I read. I thought it might be in Style's book, but Style doesn't have anything about Ibuki in here, so it's probably in one of the other books I have and I read round it. Mm. I said, yeah, I I I could be wrong, but I'm very sure I read it. And it wouldn't be unusual 8-inch guns on an aircraft carrier. Let's be honest, Lexington and Saratoga were designed on them. Then you know, treaties are abandoned in 29. What difference do you think this would have made? Bigger guns, bigger ships, and same numbers, or torpedoes? The Japanese ever consider a heavy torpedo cruiser? Uh, the Japanese did consider a heavy torpedo cruiser. They were, uh, were considering them. I think if, treaty, if the Japanese abandoned the treaties in 29... Then I would think be, uh, it would change everything for everyone, because the Japanese abandoning in twenty nine means the British and the Americans start their build up probably in about nineteen thirty one, which means the German Navy is already in trouble by nineteen thirty two. The Italian Navy could well be in trouble by nineteen thirty four, because there's a limit to what they can do. And that's the thing. They have limited maritime infrastructure. The, this is the other problem for the Japanese who are banding earlier. They are banned in 1929, then they have to deal with their own limitations of maritime infrastructure a lot earlier. <clears throat> uh, Shumi, uh, would you uh, not accept, uh, accept for a, uh, arms except for the bed if you got the subs you need on Twitch and YouTube combined? Rules law ruling like it's the London Washington Naval Treaty, and you you, you don't go. Uh, she specifically said on YouTube, that "My aunt is wise, and the ways of the of the family games." As I've said before, on the subscribing issue, this is how my family show our love for each other. We set insane family bragging rights bets. Um. Was one? Uh, what can I say? Which of the ones that can I admit that my family won't mind me admitting too out much out loud, or so, not so much that I will get uh, into trouble? Um, one of my uncles once bet another one of the uncles that they had a competition to see who could drive. The furthest distance without their wives needing to go to the loo, and the, basically the composition was both wives had to drink about uh, a full Evian bottle. That's a full sort of liter and a half Evian bottle, and it was to see how far they could go 
before that you know you know basically it was to see how far it was a measure of speed of driving but also of you know this is the competitions my family comes up with for family bragging rights okay we're an interesting family we'll just leave it at that i love them dearly this one is being subscribed it's thirteen thousand subscribers J uh, jdp19 animal here's one yep university I teach history of engineering to engineering students, and I teach history to history students occasionally, um, quite often. And I'm currently in the process of uh, applying for a post which has just come up at Exeter University. So, fingers crossed. If I get that one, that will be great because, well, there might be, uh, let, let's put it this way, it will be sort of moving at the beginning of next year. And I, before anyone else, I would keep the channel going and keep everything going, but I would, you would, I might have to move locations. So you might have a case of a couple of weeks of recorded videos while I move to new accommodations down in the southwest. Ninja, uh, Ginger Ninja two six one. Dr. Clark, Naval History Pub Quiz. Uh, I, I, I'm not allowed to take part in quizzes in my local area anymore. Our teams kept winning, so now I'm a quiz master. We'll leave that to one side. <sighs> All right, then. Animal 1636. What about 100mm AA guns? Uh, they're quite good. The thing is, the reason the 76mm starts to take up is because they are almost as fast a rate of fire, you can get them to almost as fast a rate of fire that they are put, they are filling the sky on a level compared to the 14, 15, uh, 14 millimeter cans. Um, but they're a lot lighter and easier to train around. So they provide almost as much destructive fire as the 4 inch. They provide almost as much the same volume of fire in terms of density as the 40 millimeter, but they're a lot quicker to move around than the four inch, and they're a lot more heavy hitting than the uh, 40 millimeter. So that's why the three inch tends to win, uh, starts to win a battle. Akagi had Darius Rowski. Akagi had two twin eight inch turrets in 1929. Previous, yeah. Seneca Nero, honestly, uh, once you're out of treaty, 15,000 tons are your new minimum displays of cruisers, pretty much. And Andres Galera de Garcia, hi Dr. Clark, do you play Harriers in World War II? If CS, which is your favourite? Um, I do play a couple of carriers. I am rather partial to some of the British ones, but I have to admit that I have a USS, I, 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 I have an American carrier, which I rather love. But if I say which one I love, then Jamie and Drac will never let me live it down in bilge pumps. So I'm going to keep a respectful silence on that and say that I also do a lot of with my battleships. And my battleships are, I, I, I quite enjoy my battleships. And I have both a Queen Elizabeth and a War Spite, and they both get used quite a lot. Interesting. I like them both. Stephen Lane, uh, Stephen Lane, learning point. Naval campaigns get planned many years in advance. One wonders when the next specific uh, campaign begins. That is the definite point. They do get planned a long time. They are long term things, naval operations. I'm just asking, wasn't it uh, Japanese were aware of their production limits and tried to have multi purpose ships, both scouts and Santa Cruz roles, and their ships did quite well in cruiser fights? To an extent, yes. But they made the choice to put the scouting role on the cruiser in terms of the heavy aviation. If you consider the Royal Navy with the town class cruisers, they go for four. With the cat, the cat facilities and all that stuff, they, they've got four. And four seems to be the level at which, and that's put in the center of the ship. It doesn't take up the entire aft or the entire forward. And again, they have the guns distributed around. That's really the trouble for the Japanese. That they, how do I put this? Their cruisers do quite well in cruiser fights, but those tend to be the cruiser fights earlier on in the war when they have advantages. And some later ones they do okay in. 
but honestly, they're not really first. Here is the thing. I would often say the Japanese are lucky with their enemy in fighting the Americans because of the American cruiser doctrine and what's happened to their cruisers because of it. In that if the Japanese cruisers had spent more time fighting, well, they'd been fighting the better British cruisers or the Italian cruisers, the Japanese cruisers could have found their issues would have come up. And I think with the later American cruisers, the Japanese cruisers' issues come up. In that the Japanese, their fire, their they are well armed and well armored as long as they t can dictate the pace and angle of engagement. If they can dictate those two things, they have an advantage. If they lose control over those two things, i.e. they lose control of the operations, they either don't have the information coming because their reconnaissance aircraft don't find the enemy in time, or the enemy attacks from an angle they're not expecting, then they're in trouble. Because they have to manoeuvre. And the trouble that they have is rather like, as you can see with this one, and this is the Oyoda class. Now, the Oyoda, uh, Oyoda um, class are interesting to say the least in that there is only one of this class actually built and it's laid down in february 1941 launched in april 1942 commissioned in february 1943 and sunk by air attack in july 1945 uh, it's she's eight thousand tons in standard, near eleven and a half thousand tons fully loaded. She has six Campon boilers and all those. She's armed with six one five five millimeter guns in two triple turrets, four twin hundred millimeter guns in uh, a a a guns, and six triple uh twenty five millimeter a guns. She has a okay belt and okay all, all these things but six float planes aft and the thing is this might make her quite a modern style ship but modern ships have missiles they have quite a extensive bubble around them that they can project and they can use this ship doesn't this ship Depends on its guns as its primary weapon for dealing with surface threats. And they're all forward. And aft are the float planes. And all the fuel for the float planes. And all the systems for the float planes. So that means her most. How do I put this politely? Her most vulnerable area is her least protected. Whereas if we consider the town class cruisers, which are the Royal Navy's reconnaissance cruisers in many ways, as well as their surface radars, <coughs> I mean, anti-surface radar cruisers, we think about where their aviation facilities are. They're in the center of the ship. And yeah, that's a vulnerable area if you're doing broadside fights. If you're doing broadside fights, but the thing is, the Royal Navy doesn't expect cruisers to be doing broadside fights. They expect them to be doing angled fights. So, forward, guns facing, or aft guns facing. Not straight up, line, bang, bang, bang. But, you know, sort of that sort of scenario. All those. In which case, the centre of the ship becomes quite a protected area. So... This is the limitation you're really dealing with, I think, in this room, is the divisional design, which the Japanese are doing, is quite modern in how it's approached. But, A, they're not helicopters, which means that advantage is gone. Off our memory. B, they don't have the other systems that you really need if you're going to make it like that. If I was designing this ship, the Oeda class, I would probably have gone with a Crown Colony style layout. In that, I would have probably had the aviation aft. 
but I would have had a treble six aft. I would have had the aviation sort of further forward, adjacent, uh, you know, directly behind the funnel. And then I would have had another treble six inch aft. So I'd have had nine six inches. And I'd have built it up a bit. And that's my choices. That's what I do. I do. And that's, you know, fine. You can say, well, these are the Japanese responding to the limitations of the industry and all these things. And that's quite true. But here is the point. The Japanese recognized the limitation of the industry back in the 1920s. It's one of the reasons why they come with the Kantai Kesson doctrine is the limitations of the industry. Their whole point is, at no point do they start, really start thinking, hang on, maybe the efforts we should put into here are in improving our own in industry. One of the things that often comes back is, why do the Japanese, if there is one power in the world who could really most benefit from having the ability to produce synthetic oil, i.e. oil from coal and fuel oil from coal? That's the Japanese. And if you consider the quality of, of fuel oil you need, Mm. It's, you know, that's be sensible for the Japanese, but they don't. There are lots of sensible decisions the Japanese could have made in the interwar years. And before you start saying, well, they had this, they actually consider doing these things themselves. But often, structurally, the issue is the war between the army and the navy. And the war in their internal politics, which means they don't. They'll prefer to spend a lot of money on building divisions in factories so that the planes being built in that factory for the army do not have to see the planes being built in that factory for the navy. But they don't really wrestle with the actual problems. And the navy could have done it, or the army could have done it, or both could have done it. That would have been perfectly viable. Both realize the same problems. Both don't do much about it. And this is the ultimate problem with the Japanese procurement and all the other things. And why when we get to this question. So were they worth it? The answer is almost a foregone conclusion. Were they worth it? Well, they used them. They certainly needed them. They were certainly critical in the fighting, but were they worth it? <sighs> Tian Wong, is an Agana light cruiser class? Yes, the last two were light cruiser classes, but I brought them in because I was going I felt I should talk about them as well. Um Uh, Joseph Eskins, do you think Drac would help you get to 13,000 subs? He's offering lots of ideas. He's a good pal. We're both going to be at um, HMS Belfast on Sunday, which is going to be fun. JWP19, uh, I'm playing World of Warships as I watch, and Megami just sailed past the periscope. Must be fate. Hmm. <laughs> That's game. So why the pension towards heavy cruisers and not more prolific lights? Is it due to fuel shortages strategically? Honestly, the Japanese build some very interesting light cruiser designs, and they build some very interesting heavy cruiser designs. We've been over. But in the end of it, I sometimes wonder if the Japanese really know what they want. And um, there is someone who's put it forward the interesting idea, and then it was Alzatsky, uh, you know, that both scouts and standard cruiser roles, you know, ships do quite well, that they're actually doing that fits the Japanese needs. And I can see that case, but 
the Japanese get out of the treaty system. That's their entire plan so they can build up their navy. Excuse me, moth, which could go off the books. Gone. That is the entire Japanese plan to get out of basically at that point, get out of the treaty faction. The uh, fleet faction has won. They've got out of the treaties. They're building their ships. They don't. They can't because they don't have the industry in place. And they haven't done that in, in age. They haven't done that. And they know they haven't done that. And I would say the division of these ships. If you get out of the treaties, churn out some fast escort carriers that can do the scout role. So your cruisers can concentrate on the cruiser role. That would have been a good idea. That they could have done. They have cruise liners, which they convert to various purposes. You could easily have converted some of the cruise liners on the production into a fast escort carrier that could do the reconnaissance role. And that would have made a lot of sense and been very useful. It's basically what they do with the Ibukai. The Ibukai. Ibukai. But... Hmm. They, mm, they don't do long-term thinking. This is the trouble. The Japanese, this is the thing. Uh, it, it, it sounds so bad sometimes when you put it this way. But honestly, when you look at the Japanese, their long-term strategic thinking is so patchy. They have some really good ideas and they have some really strange ideas. And it's one of my interesting points when I was doing the cheaper staffs, when I was looking at it, is, is that uh, Ernesto Bezgali, the one that came out today, that some people have been saying the video has sound problems. I'm not sure. I watched it for on YouTube and it didn't have sound problems as far as I could tell. Often, I did detect some slight popping. I'm hoping it's better this evening because I made some adjustments to the um, settings. Oh, and I mean, on this video versus that video, I, I apparently I can't go back because the trouble with YouTube accelerate seems to exacerbate whatever's even slightly off in a video. But the problem you have is that if you talk about the Royal Navy in World War Two, I can tell you exactly who comes up with a large point of junk of the fleet and is the guiding principle behind creating that fleet. With Japan, I have a very good guess. But due to their command structure and system, I'm not 100% sure. I have a good guess. I think it's Yonai. That is my... Based on the readings I've done, especially of this book and the other accounts, I think it's Yonai. But I'm not 100% sure. I definitely couldn't put my hand on heart and say it. With the Americans, I know exactly who it is. We all know who it is. It's the loudest personality in the room. It's Admiral King. Has an outsized impact on all of Japan, all of the American construction, leading up under socialism being led up to World War II. You can see that in his role in them, and his role in the meetings, and his role in what he does. So they have they have a lot of problems in Japan in terms of their structure. It, it's again the Italian Navy. One of the reasons why they produce such a coherent, sensible navy is they do actually have a guiding philosophy that decides that that helps them with their decision making. The German Navy is as disconnected because it has no maritime infrastructure, and that's what they produce. The Japanese Navy does have a maritime infrastructure. They could have built it up slightly more. They don't, and they are building these ships because they have limited structure, and they have limited maritime structure, even when they are no longer bound by the treaty system and, no lo and they're not at war 
in there. They're not fighting the war versus the Americans. I don't. This is going to sound terrible again, but the, fighting the Chinese is not sapping their resources like fighting the Americans is. The Chinese are not attacking the Japanese home island. So, yeah. Hello, John Hargreaves. Take care. No, no. There are some. Both battleships are QEs, but Warspite has plot of armor. Yes, and both are cute. And I'm trying to skip past the King George V. But I'm trying to build up. I am trying rapidly to build up because I refuse to use money. I I I, I do it all by building up the game and playing the game. I have to admit, occasionally in the past I have dipped in to just because I wanted to skip designs. But I'm refusing to use money. I'm trying to skip past the King George V with honor. So I'm basically using HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Warspite to blast my way past it. Joseph Askins, uh, time for me to go. Have to clear my head before li uh, linear algebra test. Good luck. Come on, husband. I have a soft spot for Odo's, but I realize love is blind. It is. And Stradling, would be nice to visit Blail Pass. It is going to be nice to visit her. I'm looking forward to some honor. Uh, they were in the sense they were uh, they made the Battle of uh, they were in the sense they made the Battle of Canal, Guadalcanal possible. Yes, Japanese heavy cruisers were critical to the Battle of Guadalcanal and various other operations in World War II. They were critical assets, which is one of the reasons why I find the Japanese development of them so upsetting. Because these ships turn out to be some of the most valuable assets in war. They predicted they were going to be valuable assets, and yet. I keep coming back to those t uh, those five twin ten inch turrets, so uh, five twin eight inch turrets. I mean, ten guns, and the only design I really ha think is a well thought out gun design is the Megami class, and honestly, they have the uh, this is going to get me in trouble hunchback funnel, um. They are a well designed. They are a good design, but the Japanese could have been doing that from the beginning. If you're going to cheat, cheat big. They don't. So the Japanese cruisers are as useful as the Dupi de Lume and hurry up. To an extent, yeah. Um, uh, Knight 6831. Uh, Was IJN Taco the unluckiest Taco class heavy cruiser? Probably. Hieroglyph. It's important to understand that this is not a war Japan can win. No. So it's a question of how to lose as slow or quick, as slowly or quickly as possible. Uh, yes, but the thing is, to lose it slowly, you need. You, you, they could have built better cruisers. And I'll take from six five. That's Clark. Thank you for what you do. Both you and Drag really help pass the time when I drive through and down road. I'm glad. Thank you. Nine six three and six eight three one. How much of a threat were the two renowned class battle cruisers, Renault Pulse and the lone Admiral class battle cruisers, put to the Japanese cruiser fleet? Uh, well, if they managed to engage them in a gun duel, they could have probably wiped out pretty much any one one on one quite happily. Uh, it would require quite a pack of cruisers to take them down. If it was a torpedo duel at night, an ambush, then they might get lucky and they might take them out. But again, it depends what area, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of scenarios involved. And also, there is the fact that the odds are, if you have a renowned class battle cruiser hunting her there, hunting them down, they're going to be with some town class cruisers as well. So it's going to be a pack coming after you. 9.36 p.m. Uh, that was good. Um, how often was the political leadership of Japan, uh, Japanese Navy changed in the interwar period? Also, how much were they distracted by avoiding assassination attempts? Like, as, I discuss, as I point out in the Chief of Staffs, um, the Japanese have a very stable period. Uh, you, you might think that there is a lot of instability with the Chief of Staff, but the, really the Chief of Staff is quite stable. 
and Yonai and Pri the Prince are basically the two leaders for quite a long time. And at one point, one of the ministers of the Navy ends up becoming the Prime Minister. Oh, no, Chiefs, is he Chief Staff Prime Minister of the Navy? Um, I think he ends up becoming Prime Minister. Yeah, but I think it was Minister. They, uh, assassination attempts do have an impact, but they don't really have the impact uh, you would suggest they have, uh, you would think they have in terms of mm, changing doctrine or philosophy. Aroglyph, is learning Japanese a necessary step to understanding current Pacific naval issues, or can I skip that one? I'd learn Japanese just for the fun of it. I'd like to learn Japanese. I keep trying to. Uh, Abzowski, I'm sorry, I generally have a soft spot via Jane Heavy Cruisers, and I'm fully aware that going into night short-range brawl while half your ship is fragile and higher farmal is not a good idea. Yeah. That's the trouble. Uh, it's good. Look, having a reconnaissance cruiser is not a bad idea. Going to the extent they do, and I would argue this is why actually you get the Ibukai. Ibukai. Because... It's honestly the honest thing. This is what they've been wanting. This is what they should have almost been building since 1936, at least. And they should have churned out a couple of these. Three or four. Maybe, I don't know. They should have built the yards that could build them. Again, they know they're going to be leaving the treaty. They make the decision to leave the treaty. And it takes them a while before they leave it. So... They know they're going to be leaving the treaty, so prepare for it. Build some infrastructure. Build some more shipyards. Build some more fitting out yards. Maybe build, I don't know, synthetic oil plant, or two, or three, or four, or five. If you think you're going to war and you're going to leave the treaties, you might as well go out properly and start building the facilities you need. Something in real life, War Spy has plot armor. Yeah, she does. On uh, she also seems to have plot armor on the World of Warship sometimes. Andrew Cox, if you're going to skip an RN battleship, skip Monarch. It's da. I'm skipping the Ching Daughter V. The 14 inches is just disappointing to me. I might well skip the Monarch as well. I don't know. Um, Knight six eight three one. How did how did the IGN respond if the British had five Hawkins, six County, and seven York class heavy cruisers before World War Two? Uh, probably build a lot more. But the thing is, the five Hawkins aren't much use. And if they have sixteen County and seven Hawkins class heavy cruiser, a uh, seven York class, uh, then they have. 16 8 inch gun, uh, 8 8 inch gun uh, cru uh, cruisers and 7 6 inch, uh, 6 8 in uh, 7 um, 6 8 inch gun cruisers. So, yeah. They'd probably be, uh, let's be honest, they're probably more worried about the town class if they'd be enough reduced. That's always the more thing, interesting thing. Uh, and that's six, uh, 6 8 frame, the rival to the town class. Yeah, um, if the if they if the Royal Navy had been building more town class, uh, more Yorks instead of town class, the Royal Navy would have had a lot more heavy cruisers. But also the the Japanese would have had uh, would probably been able to build more heavy cruisers. Remember they have a seven ten split, so if the British are able to build twenty uh, are able under that count, they have. They have 28 heavy cruisers on that one. You might as well round up and say the British are allowed 30 heavy cruisers. In which case, the Japanese would have been allowed 21. Because the British, would have, that would have been have to be in the tonnage limit of the British. Andrew Cooks, I mean, if you're going to cheat, why bother sticking 8-inch guns? And that's the other interesting thing. They could have done a full Yamato uh, thing on their cruisers and gone for 9-inch or something more powerful. Decision. So, what would you have built instead to work with the rest of the IJM? Hmm. See, I'd have gone with some of the designs they had, but I'd have just modified them. As said, 
I would have gone with slightly bigger, probably treble 8 inch designs. I might have gone with, especially, I might well have been tempted by the concept of going for 9 8 inch guns in 3 treble turrets. And I say this for a reason. Because if I could have put 2 treble turrets forward, then I have 6 for firing forward. I have 1 aft broadside, and then I can have a nice aviation facility as well. And if I've got three treble turrets, they're going to take up less space on my hull than five twins. Though I might be slightly broader beam, but that actually helps with my aviation facilities. If I'm going for aviation or something. And, you know, that makes the point. And then if anyone is coming to attack me from behind, well, hmm. And I'd have probably had a lot more of the uh, double 100 mils or double 76 mils guns over them. I would have plastered those holes in that. Especially as uh, my, my point would have been, uh, my case would have been quite simple. They're carrying the the 8-inch guns to deal with enemy cruisers. The odds are they'll, not, they'll, they'll be fighting equivalent number of cruisers. Or... They'll be fighting an eight-gun cruiser, an eight-inch eight, eight, eight cruiser, eight-eighth-inch cruiser, in which case they can use the two treble turrets forward to get a deal with that, and they can use the aft treble turret to ward off another one if they need to. But with enough of the 100 millimeters in a dual purpose, or the four-inch four guns in dual purpose, then they can also deal with any destroyers which try to get them close to them. Andrew Cox, the IJ is in a weird place. They are isolated in an ocean where they can't really attack trade routes or do anything to force on opponents to sue for peace. So what's the strategy to inflict loads of damage and sue for peace? Pretty much that was their idea. Have a battle, have a battle, inflict loads of damage, and then try and, and dictate peace. This one, I was thinking more that the assassination attempts and other political shenanigans would distract and take up the due style of time, so he wasn't concentrating on doctrine. Um, for a while, the uh, the, uh, for quite a long time, as I covered, the uh, cheapest staff of the, of the Japanese Navy was a prince. Uh, and he was actually from the fleet faction. He was the head of the fleet faction. So you can say that both his faction was the most likely to do the assassinations uh, in terms of internal in the navy, and his faction uh, he was the safest from assassination because no one was going to um, attack a prince of the blood. Senator, general elections are on Sunday, and every time I return to stream, I get an election ad. I'm sorry about that. But no. So honestly, probably not really. Derp Scott, you should. Uh, you said Japan should have built more naval infrastructure. What limitations on cruiser size and abilities did infrastructure impose, or was the limitation more about numbers? Limitation in uh, the infrastructure imposes a lot of uh, impact on them. Um, it's one of the reasons why the light cruisers are limited in size. They are because they have a limitation in number of yards they can use. Uh, a couple more slipways, a couple more yards would have made a huge difference to Japanese infrastructure. And if we're, we're talking about not massive yards, we're not talking about yards. This is the other thing. When you ever get you start to have a, a talk about infrastructure in Japan, everyone turns around and goes, "Oh, you, you know, you, you can't fit yards for a Yamamoto in more places." And you go, "No, I'm not talking about a Yamamoto." Um. The Ibuki class, they are. 200 meters long overall as designed Yamoto class are roughly 260 meters long one needs probably a position about uh, uh, needs a very uh, uh, you know 260 meters long and roughly 40 meters wide. 
roughly 265 and 40 meters. So one needs a very large dry dock to build and slip weigh facilities. The other one, the Ibuki class, Ibuki class that, knee, that is 20 meters beam and 200 meters. So theoretically, in the same amount of space for the same length of land, roughly, but in the same width of land, you could fit two dry docks that could probably take uh, for, for one of these cruisers, as you could Miyamoto. You're also more likely to be able to build one of these further out, i.e. artificially build it. And that's the other thing you can do. Britain had a few docks like this. There are other docks which are built around the world like this, where instead of you digging into the ground, uh, digging into the ground, you actually build it out. You find an area, a suitable bay, and you build out to build up a dock and build the facilities. And this is what Japan needed to do. Again, we, people often go back to earthquakes and the various natural disasters they have. They do. They they suffer from them. And that is a problem. But that hasn't stopped Japan building up the industry it has built up. And that hasn't stopped it building up everything else it's built up in terms of nation state. If they can, if they can get themselves around to it, they can do it. And honestly, if any nation could have built up their infrastructure, it is Japan and Japanese, and could have justified it. The Italians, it's a constant fight with the ego of Mussolini to get the funding they need for those sort of things. Germany is being watched like a hawk by the French, the British, and every other power if they build up their maritime infrastructure. Japan could say, we're building up a maritime infrastructure to build up our merchant fleet. We're building up our maritime infrastructure because we are the third power in the, in the naval treaties, and we feel we should have infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure equivalent to this status. There are all sorts of reasons. And again, if anyone needs to build up their infrastructure, it's Japan. They need to build up their steel mills. They need to build up their yards. They need to build up their armaments factories. They need to build up lots of things. And they could have got away with it. Again, the reality is this would never have happened with Japan. But if the army and navy had managed to actually come to an agreement on guns and standardize on guns, the efficiency that they could have achieved in terms of producing guns would have been amazing. If Japan had pretty much a more normal government and actually the prime minister was actually able to impose their authority on the services, then Japan's war effort could have been far, far greater. And this is something we often misunderstand in World War II. Japan, yes, could never win against the Americans. But the amount of damage and the time World War II could have lasted if she'd had a more efficiently run and organized armaments industry and a more coherent approach to the war effort, i.e. we're fighting the Americans, they're a far bigger threat than the Chinese, Let's concentrate on fighting the Americans until we've beaten the Americans or got peace with them. We're just going to ignore the Chinese. And we're going to reinforce all our things. Because again, imagine if the troops which the Ch Japanese army was using in China had been available for operations in the Pacific. Especially at the beginning of the war. Imagine if Japan had actually managed to land. And this is the thing is they, it, we always talk about the resources that now all these things that stop them landing in, in, in Australia. But if they'd actually had the troops and managed to be using the resources more sensibly, they could have had the resources if they'd stockpiled them, especially if they thought war's coming, let's stockpile everything from massive search. They could have landed in Australia. They'd have then probably got beaten up by kangaroos, but that's because Australian kangaroos are vicious. Joke. That's the wind up, Jamie. It wouldn't be the kangaroos. It would be the spiders in Australia. Let's be honest, the spiders would wipe out any invading army. Cascadian, does Japan have paper light cruiser designs? And if so, where can I look at them? Really curious about them, Al. 
there aren't really any good books at the moment. Um, there are some good books coming. And there are some uh, books on Japanese light cruisers, etc., which are equivalent to the ones on Royal Navy light cruisers from the Osprey series. So that's probably the best place to go at the moment. John Evans, I keep getting manscaping ads for some reason. I'm sorry. David Hunt, uh, uh, John, uh, uh, David Hunt, I much prefer the game merchandise of War Thunder over World Warships, uh, mechanics of War Thunder over World Warships. Of course, at the same time, War Thunder doesn't have anything above cruiser grade or, Itali or, or Italian ships. Hmm. I'll get there eventually. That's what. Did Japan's economic and resource situation allow a marked increase in spending on naval infrastructure? Um. They could have done if they they did have the facilities there. They did have the money and stuff there. They could have done it. Read Japanese radar. It looks like that was way more advanced and widely used than it's commonly held. This in the Bilge Pumps podcast episode um, thirty eight. True. King Knight six eight three one. What's the Japanese uh, uh, the IJN's eight eight plan viable? Um, it would have taken them time. They might have got there eventually, but it would take them time. Uh, Vision, if they had a normal government, they wouldn't have been in war in China, let alone the US and UK. Oh, they would have. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, no sorry. When I say normal government, I mean normal government as in the Prime Minister able to take charge. Uh, don't think there was anyone who would not have been expanding Japan into China. They might not have taken on Russia, and they might not have invaded, but you know, in the nicest way, no, they would have still been fighting in China. Something clear. How long would World War II in Japan uh, in the Pacific last if an organized Japan scenario? You'd probably be talking about another year to two years. Even Japan landing for a landing or uh, for a la land raid in Hawaii just to loot and burn everything what left could have caused an issue. Yes. Naga, nonsense. The emus are the true master of Australia. Look, no, what? Look, the emus cannot be deployed. If they deploy the emus, that is a war crime. I maintain on the Australian part of the Australian government. That would just be terrible. There are some They had Korea just build six cruiser slipways and docks in some Korea. That would have been a sensible option. David James D. I'm glad to hear that. David Hunt, I'm afraid you're incorrect. War Thunder now has both an Italian fleet and some battleships. Early dreadnoughts, but still. Ooh. Andrew Cox. Good night, all. Have to be up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Well, take care. I'm just about to finish uh, because I have to go put dog use to bed. The fluffy research assistants need to sleep, but I will be staying. And there'll be about another seven minutes while I finish off answer questions, etc. So it'll be, it gets about three and a half hours long the stream. Um, let's see. What have I got coming up? We have on Sunday Amphibious Ship Development from the 1980s to the modern day. So that's going to be Sunday's video. And the Sunday Long Patrol, i.e. the video, Long Patrol video that comes out in the morning, is going to be the cru uh, Japanese cruiser one. Because I'm probably not going to do a Long Patrol on the Amphibious Ship Development from the 1980s because it's all going to be in the live. Um, but this, will be go uh, this Long Patrol will be going up while I'm bored HMS Belfast. Um, book or two reviews. I've got a whole lot stockpiled, which I need to start uploading. And next Thursday, we have interwar naval aircraft development, especially what could have been. And then we have HMS Dreadnought Day coming up on the 2nd of October. And that's going to be a really fun day on that Saturday. Vision. Aaron, is everyone thought Japan was going to take over the world in the 1980s? Building up commercial power would have worked far better than military expansion. Probably potentially. And... I'm just going to add this one in again. This is another one of the designs you can buy on the Spreadshirt store, which of course starts off me talking about my aunt. Now, as you, as those of you who watched the beginning will know, but some of you turned in the end, I've currently got a competition, uh, a little um, family wager for bragging rights of my aunt going. That if I can get to 13,000 subscribers by December the 31st, 2021, she and my uncle will wear Blackburn Blackburn, which you can buy off this one, face masks, take their photo, and I'll be able to put it up on Brewships in January, on January the 2nd. So, 
please. Thank you. Um, right. Take care, Shimmy. Uh, Timmy M. Something. Hello, Timmy. What was the purpose of the towers on Megami B and X towers? Radio antenna? Um, interesting thing. Those, the towers are for various scenarios. But <laughs> to be honest, it does seem to be. How do I put this politely? Uh, the, the scaffolding is kind of an interesting thing. I think it is. Uh, they are to do with the wire aerials, which go around, definitely. And they're to do with the, uh, the structure for the wire aerials. But there are some very interesting reports to put them down to other things. And suggest they might have been, uh, you know, part of radar, uh, fire control systems, etc. But no, they are, as far as I can tell, radio antennae. Part of the wire antenna and that goes back and forth on the ships. Uh, so, uh, John Shane, thank you. See you next live. Thank you. Um, thank you for the stream. It's a pleasure, Jack Ray. Vision. All right, uh, the answer to one. Uh, what about those U.S. space uniforms? I have already answered on Twitter. I think someone in the U.S. is obsessed with Battlestar Galactica and Starship Troopers. That squad. The tip of the tower was in the center of the ra turret ring, so it didn't move. Yes, it supported the radio antenna. Hmm. Ninja Ninja, 261. Thanks for the stream and answering questions. Hope you win a bet. It's always a pleasure. It's what I do these things for. Um, as I've said many times, the reason I do this and the reason I will continue to do this, even if I get a, a proper a tenured lecturing post rather than a contract post, is because it allows me to talk with a lot more people about naval history and share the fun that is naval history. And there is so much to talk about. There is so so much to talk about it's never ending and who knows what are going to be the patron suggestions which are going to come in for october who knows what the patron suggestions are going to be that come in for november december and who knows what i will pick because as we all know sometimes the most random topics are the ones i go right i fancy doing something random this month and what book should i pick out and then pick a topic from Cascadian, I remember a video was discussing how all the nations wanted twin engine aircraft for naval aviation purposes. Any chance you can do a video discussing that topic? I will probably do a video discussing that topic at some point, yeah. Because they all wanted them. Good night, Rick Vasala. <laughs> Burn the despicable mono. <laughs> oh. Standing there. I'm not sure about that. And this video is fun, but I'm still at work and we'll be heading to the San Francisco area. Good luck. Come on, please be observed. I worry about you. Uh... <laughs> um. Seneca, the emblem of the Space Force looks like a non-copyright infringing version of the Star Trek logo. It's interesting. Uh, John Shake, plus, can't wait for the 10 uh, to, uh, that day is my birthday, so, uh, uh, for the 2nd of October, so I'd like, uh, so that is why I like naval ships. Uh, change a bit more. Higher service life laid down on the same day 116 years ago. Mm. It's a fun thing to talk about. It really is. And it's going to be fun to get through, because... Honestly, I'm planning on maybe doing more than um, doing more than one live that day, and I'm going to see if I can have a pal come right over here and we can have a discussion with you all through the same camera chatting away. We're going to see. Ryan, take care, everyone. Thank you, and um, thank you very much.